Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. That's right, we've got a busy show here today. Core personal consumption expenditures, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, coming in below 3% for the first time in nearly three years before the Fed's rate hike campaign. We'll break down what this means for the overall health of the labor market, the Fed policy read through, and equity market reaction. And that's not all. When you take a look at the broader markets, one name that's sticking out to us is Intel. The shares tanking on disappointing results. It's putting pressure on the AI player. Does the report signal broader weakness for the sector? We've got analyst reaction in just a few minutes. We will also hear from Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger in the 11 a.m. hour today. But first, let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know. Your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Jared Blickery, and Josh Lipton have more. Hey, Sean, a core personal consumption expenditures. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge coming in below 3% for the first time in nearly three years. That's back before the Fed's rate hiking campaign began. The index growing 2.6% year over year in December, in line with last month's print. But core PCE, that's excluding volatile food and energy categories, grew 2.9%, down from 3.2% from the month prior. We'll dig into what this means for the Fed and rate cuts. And Intel weighing on markets this morning, the chipmaker falling behind competition among the AI players. And that's after reporting disappointing unit results and offering an outlook for the current quarter that came in below expectations. We're gonna discuss how the company can recover from these disappointments. And the wave of layoffs continues to sweep the U.S. Salesforce and Microsoft are the latest companies joining that growing list of job cuts. Salesforce laying off nearly 700 employees, according to the Wall Street Journal. That's amid ongoing cost-cutting pressures from investors. And Microsoft is cutting around 1,900 jobs, impacting workers at Activision, Blizzard, and Xbox. We're going to break down what this means for the overall health of the labor market. Uh, happy Friday to all the folks out there watching the final Friday in the first month of this year. Wow, 2024, off to a ripping start. Let's take a look at stock futures. They are trading lower this morning for the Dow and the NASDAQ, while the S&P 500 is flat just barely to the upside by the hair of its chinny-chin-chin. Chin. You're seeing the Dow lower by about uh, seven hundredths of a percent right now. NASDAQ futures down by about three tenths of a percent. Also taking a brief look at treasuries here. We've got the five, the 10 year and the 30 year that we're going to toss up on screen here for you. Uh, we've been tracking it throughout the morning as well here and we'll get that for you in a hot second here uh, as we're calibrating some of our own readings here. All right. Well, Brad, there is a lot to break down. Let's talk about some of the movers here this morning. We mentioned Intel, the fact that shares are lower, but also American Express, Coinbase, Visa, all of the top trending tickers on Yahoo Finance this morning. We're going to break down exactly the impact that this is having to your investment portfolio. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge is out this morning. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer here to break down the numbers and what it means for monetary policy. Josh, <laughs> what have we seen? Uh, what most notably stuck out to you? Here? Inflation coming down, Brad. Yeah. I mean, inflation coming down is obviously always a good thing. We debate all the time with this different economic news. If good news is good news or bad news is good news or sort of how that works. But the inflation read is always pretty linear, right? We want to see that number lower. And the key takeaway today would be the core PCE number coming in at 2.9%. It's the first time we've seen that number below 3% going back to the spring of 2021, so nearly three years. And there's another chart that a lot of people are highlighting today that I think really gets at kind of the core of this conversation, perhaps maybe pun intended. Um, and that's the three month chart and the six month chart that we look at of core PCE. Those two charts, so the annualized for the last three months, the annualized for the last six months, you can see them there, your purple and blue lines, they're below that dotted line, which is the Fed's target. So for the camp that wants the Fed to cut, that is sort of the argument here as well. If you look at the recent trend, 
we're below 2%. Do you think this does, Josh, set the stage here for the Fed to eventually pivot? I mean, that is the topic that we've been discussing now at nauseum, it seems like. But when you get a read like this, and especially the chart that you just put up there, when you take a look at the basis here on a six-month and a three-month timeline, that does then further support that claim. It does, and you have to wonder how worried. It'll be interesting to see what Powell says next week about how worried the Fed would be about being too tight and ruining this yeah. good economic data that we've seen, right? You're kind of in that call it Goldilocks scenario a little bit right now, and you wonder how nervous the Fed is gonna get that they might be too restrictive. Mm -hmm. At what point do they just start saying, all right, we'll cut in March. That doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna cut in May too, right? I think that's part of the conversation that we're gonna start having here too is, well, maybe we're not gonna get six cuts or five cuts. Maybe it actually is the three that's currently in the SEP. And that's the amount of cuts that we get because the economy is doing well. I think that's what people are gonna be talking about here is the fact that we don't wanna ruin what is essentially looking like soft landing da data with positive overall positive economy and inflation coming down. All right, Josh, thanks so much. Helping us break down some of the economic data that's come out here to end the week. Now, Josh, appreciate it. Switching gears, one of the major tickers that is moving, trending on the Yahoo Finance platform this morning, Intel. Intel shares sinking after its first quarter outlook falls well short of expectations. The company's forecast is a stark contrast to its competitors, NVIDIA, AMD, and Taiwan Semiconductor, which are seeing artificial intelligence demand as a major boost to growth. Intel seems to be falling behind. Joining us now for more on this, we've got Christopher Dinelli, who is the city head of U.S. Semiconductor Research. Uh, Christopher, great to have you here uh, this morning. Chris, as you sure. kind of think back to the tenor that was struck by this, this executive team last night, I mean, ultimately vastly different from what we've heard from some of the other semiconductor companies over the course of this earnings season, at least early on and uh, even pointing to last season as well. Yeah, so there's uh, two things going on with Intel. I think number one is they really don't have uh, a quote unquote AI product uh, that's helping obviously NVIDIA and AMD and TSMC and many other companies out there. Um, that's, um, that's coming out later. Uh, but the other is I find it ironic that the main reason they guided so poorly was their quote unquote growth businesses uh, are not growing and in fact they're contracting. If you look at the core business for Intel, they're PC and server microprocessors, that business is fine. Uh, it's just everything else from, you know, the programmable logic parts, the auto business, uh, the foundry business, that's all falling off fairly rapidly in Q1. That's what's causing the, the big guy down. So, Chris, when you see the market's reaction like this, the fact that shares are selling off to the extent that they are in the pre-market, do you think that move then to the downside is justified? Sounds like it. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. So I'm actually glad you asked that question. I've been getting that question from a lot of investors this morning, and I wanted to explain something. So there's two classes of investors uh, for, for the market, right? There's the mutual funds like Janus or Fidelity that are like an aircraft carrier that you know have large pools of money, but they move very slowly. Uh, and, and they're, you know, I would say not super interested in Intel right now, but then you also have hedge funds that probably make up, you know, half of the investing in, in my group in semiconductors, and they can literally get in and out of stocks in a day. And what we've seen over the last couple of months as Intel stock has spiked was a lot of interest from hedge funds. But all of a sudden, if they see something that they don't like, you know, they're all going to get out today and they might get back into the stock in a week or a month or something like that. But I think that you know, the volatility today is, is is really being caused by a lot of these hedge funds that were expecting a fairly nice guide from Intel and, and didn't get it. So they're going to run for the hills. How much spending are you anticipating Intel, Intel still needs to put forward, even just to ramp up the capacity that it's going to be bringing online to produce chips? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So, you know, historically, their amount of spending relative to sales has hovered around 17%. And this is going back like 30 years. Yep, sometimes it'll go to 20, sometimes it'll go to 15. They're essentially doubling that uh, for the next you know, three or four years. And as a result, um, you're also seeing a big increase in depreciation. This is something they mentioned on the call last night. Their depreciation, which actually you know, weighs on gross margin is going up $2 billion this year. It's also gonna go up next year. And it's also going to go up the year after that. Uh, and I think the, the big disappointment was not necessarily on the revenue forecast, but was on the gross margin forecast. And I think that's a direct result of all this increased investment, which is not going away anytime soon. 
Yeah, and Chris, when you take all that into account, and we're going to be uh, speaking with our colleague Brian Sazi, he's going to be speaking with uh, Pat in just about two hours from now, Pat Gelsinger, the CEO there of Intel. But he was optimistic, not exactly a surprise, on the earnings call here, saying that even though uh, Q1 maybe is a little bit more challenging, he does expect the rest of 2024 to improve quarter by quarter. Do you agree with that sentiment? Or I guess, what do you think, more specifically, the next couple of quarters are going to look like here for Intel? Sure. Um, so yeah, Pat is the Tony Robbins of semis. He's all he's always in a good mood, uh, and I would say that Intel has probably the best uh, management team out there. So we're big fans of Pat and also their their CFO Dave Zinsner. Pat has been very upfront about the amount of investment required and the trials and tribulations that the company is going to go through over the next couple of years as they make the necessary spending and you know take a bit of a gross margin hit. So I think from from Pat's or Intel or even, you know, like a long-term investor's perspective, uh, this is all fine. It's just, you know, you get a lot of uh, a lot of topsy-turvy results as you're investing for the future. And I think for us, you know, they have a bit of a two-pronged approach here. We like one of the approaches. We don't necessarily like the other approach. They're trying to get the manufacturing lead back. I think Pat has been instrumental uh, in making progress there. The other part is they're trying to become a successful foundry. We actually do not think that uh, that that's going to work. Uh, just how much exposure do you believe that Intel also still carries as a result of some of the EV, not total drawdown, but at, at least some of the ambitions that we've seen from the big three automakers here, especially kind of pulling back on, on production in the near term? Yeah, good question. So Intel's uh, auto business, which essentially is mostly a company called Mobileye, and then they also have some processors, is really only about four or five percent of revenue. It's it's fairly small, uh, but Mobileye negatively pre-announced, uh, and it's going to take a pretty big drop in Q1. So that's that's going to be you know a couple hundred million. It's a couple percent, uh, literally off of their uh, off of their Q1. So that that hurts. But again, in terms of the grand scheme of things. Core processing is still 75% of Intel. PC uh, chips for desktop, notebook, server. That's, in our opinion, that's what's really going to drive the company. And that's where they need to get the manufacturing right to, in our opinion, you know, really add to long-term value. All right, Chris, we always appreciate your insight. Thanks so much for hopping on with us and breaking down these results. Again, a ton of pressure on Intel stock here ahead of the open with shares selling off on those lackluster reports. And like we mentioned a few times here, keep it locked in on Yahoo Finance because Brian Sazi will be speaking with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger. That's happening at 11.35 a.m. Eastern time this morning. Well, disruptions in the workforce, Salesforce, the latest tech giant to announce layoffs. This is according to a report from the Wall Street Journal. Now, the cuts will affect around 700 employees, and it comes just about a year after the company cut about 10% of its workforce in an effort to reduce costs. Now, Salesforce joining a long list of companies that have been forced to make this decision as they look to right-size their workforce. Now, the list including Microsoft, Amazon, and Alphabet. And Brad, more specifically, when you take a look at Salesforce's business, yes, this pales almost in comparison. You never really want to uh, discount any of any news like this, but just putting it in perspective for our viewers, I think is a better way to put it here. This is 1% one percent of the workforce compared to the cut that we got just about a year ago, which was 10% of the workforce. And since they initially embarked on this cost-cutting journey, we have seen the stock up just about 80% over the past year, far outpacing many of its competitors. So I think the fact that Mark Benioff con uh, continuing to make these types of strategic moves that he sees necessary as the company further positions for growth that Benioff has told many times here at Yahoo Finance, just in terms of the optimism and the hype surrounding AI. And we know Benioff is a big believer in that. And he has said it time and time again that it really has the opportunity to boost worker productivity and also revenue by as much as 30 percent. Yeah, there are 25 open jobs right now that match specifically artificial intelligence at this company. So you think about where that hiring is actually perhaps even going to backfill some of the jobs that are being cut at this point as a pivot is clearly in play. We've heard that from multiple companies, whether that be Google, whether that be Microsoft or Amazon, as you were mentioning a moment ago, all of them trying to figure out where they can 
put the best allocation of headcount and resources towards this next almost cloud-like moment for the industry here. Some have called it the smartphone moment. Okay, that, uh, that remains to be seen. But if there's anything that we can almost guarantee that artificial intelligence will be in terms of a layer on for these companies, it is similar or anal analogous to the type of benefit that they saw from cloud, and that's expected. Even when you heard from SAP and some of the restructure that's taking place there, we talked about that earlier this mm -hmm. week. Last time I had seen any type of um, headcount restructuring like that, they were bracing, and, and not even bracing, they were gearing up for the cloud. And so that's the next inflection point, and making sure that they've got people in the right places in order to uh, bring some of these solutions to life in the near term. Certainly, all right, well, Salesforce, a name to keep on your radar here at, for today's trading day. Well, also coming up, we're gonna be taking a look at the move that we're seeing in Coinbase shares moving higher on an upgrade from Oppenheimer. Plus, we're also getting some commentary out from American Express. The company just reporting earnings that were better than expected. We're seeing some of that excitement in the share price here this morning with the stock up just about 1%. Brian Sazi speaking with the CEO. He'll bring us those comments when we come back. We're watching shares of American Express here this morning. The stock up just about 1.5% after the company reiterated its profit forecast and gave full year earnings guidance that topped expectations. We've got Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi here on set. Brian, you are the guy to talk to about these earnings, and you just got off the phone with CEO Chris Squarey as well. Yeah, it was good to uh, catch up with him. Uh it was an interesting quarter because on the surface, yeah. guys, he, he, the Amex came out here and, and they missed earnings estimates. Now, I, I asked Steve right out of the gate here, why did you miss these earnings estimates? And he pointed to the devaluation uh, of the Argentine peso that occurred in December. Now, this is something we heard this week from the likes of Puma and other companies. That is starting to impact uh, results for a lot of multinational companies. And if you're an investor out there uh, and you're investing in companies that are globally, globally oriented, it's something you want to keep in mind. And nonetheless, uh, 
I think the street is really focused in on this company's outlook for this year, well ahead of consensus uh, by more than 20 cents uh, in terms of earnings guidance range. Steve, uh, he told me that the business is doing well. Uh, I think he would call it resilient. Uh, and he's expecting these trends to largely continue. One thing I would watch too, guys, they're expecting 40 product refreshes this year. That is more updates to what they're offering to consumers this year versus last year. So something to watch, uh, perhaps setting the table for a higher price or raising the prices again for the Amex card. Now, Steve didn't tell me that, but it's just me reading some tea leaves. I mean, what can we extrapolate about the consumer from these earnings? And, and what did he have to say about that? Too? Yeah, I, I, Steve said the, uh, he acknowledged that the economy was slowing. So that was uh, Steve's exact quote here, that the economy was slowing, but he expects the company can do good really in any environment. Uh, and I think that shows in terms of how much optimism, optimism he has laid out in terms of guidance. Now, compared to what we heard, what we just heard from Amex today, from what we heard from Visa yesterday, Visa called out something very important. Uh, sales each quarter, uh, the, the consumer spending was, was soft or mixed each month of the quarter and weak in January in large part because of weather. I think that is more a reflection of Visa being more value-oriented value, value oriented in terms of customer focus and Amex being more tar tied to high-end shoppers who are still enjoying probably a lot of gains on their NVIDIA shares. A lot of LVMH too. LVMH, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That was actually another astonishing report here when we talk about the resilient consumer, the fact that people are still out there spending. We've been talking about time and time again that we are waiting or anticipating for this deterioration in the consumer, and it's just not happening. Well, so it, it's showing up a little bit. Uh, so yeah. in Amex results, I don't want to be all Pollyannish here. I mean, their credit card write-offs or, or the credit loss provisions, 1.44 billion, that was up 40% year over year. So there are consumers out there saying, I just bought too much stuff, man, and I have to write this off, and I just can't pay this bill at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. So there is some stress, but by and large, to your point, Shona, Rates are much higher yeah. year over year, and yet consumers are still out there buying probably a lot of junk they don't need. Yeah, well, certainly, maybe the better way that I should have put it is much better than expected, it seems like, time and time again. Yes, we are seeing some deterioration, but still. How do you like your new Mercedes you put on the Amex card? I wish. I wish. <laughs> One day. One day. All right, so thanks. Well, let's start, uh, continue talking about the consumer here because LVMH shares Rocketing higher this morning, seeing fourth quarter organic revenue climb 10% from a year ago. The owner of Louis Vuitton also raising its annual dividend. And similar to what we were just talking about with Amex, this is another company that's showing that the consumer is still out there spending. And specifically here with LVMH, there was a little bit of hesitancy or trepidation, maybe I should say, going into this quarter here, going into these results, Brad, that we would see a further deterioration given the fact that maybe there were some trends heading into the holiday season that people have been pulling back on some of the higher end spending. But when you take right. a look at these results, it really certainly is putting any of those fears at rest. It is important to point out that there is some analyst commentary out there this morning, Morningstar being amongst them, saying that, hey, we're not out of the woods right. just yet. But yes, this is a very strong report here for the broader sector. I mean, it's a different consumer, right, too? When you think about LVMH and who they're typically marketing to, it's typically more high affluent, has a propensity to spend even in a uh, compressed or uh, uh, pressured economy, I should say. And so when we think about where they're still seeing strong organic revenue growth, it's coming in across all business groups except for wine and spirits. And ultimately, they saw market share gains worldwide here. But it's also worldwide where they're seeing some of that growth. They saw double-digit organic revenue growth in Europe, Japan, the rest of Asia as well. Um, and growth in Champagne actually driven, they said, by some of the value strategy. And a transitional year for Cognac after two years of strong growth. Maybe they should talk to uh, Shannon Sharp on that. He could help them out. But anyway, uh, fragrances. We talk about these little luxuries. Fragrances doing well. Strong momentum there. And and that is an area that I think a lot of investors would be apt to pay close attention to over the course of this earnings season when we hear even more from some of the retailers that carry even some of the mid-tier to lower-tier fragrances and, of course, self-care Sunday trade, if you will. That's going to be particularly noteworthy because it's all of the areas that customers are still willing to perhaps pay for that little luxury and in order to kind of still have that retail therapy at the end of the day, too. Yeah, certainly. And you see it reflected in the, sh in the share prices, too, right? It is, yeah. Some absolutely. Some of excitement this morning. Well, we've also tracked a share price reaction in Coinbase here this morning. Coinbase shares are getting a boost with Oppenheimer upgrading the stock to outperform from perform and initiating its price target at $160 per share. The analyst behind the call citing Coinbase as a stronger than many people has strong than many people realize, excuse me. There you're taking a look at the price target, $160 here. We were taking a look at the shares a moment ago. And this is actually 
kind of uh, a lift for the broader kind of crypto annex to crypto trading names out there as well. Uh, we were tracking Marathon. That's one of the top trending tickers on the Yahoo Finance platform right now this morning, pre-market with about six minutes until the start of trade. And Bitcoin as well. Perhaps we could take a quick look at that just to see how things are faring there because ultimately over the course of this week, there was a lot of concern about whether or not we'd be able to keep this 40,000 level. We eventually got back up to and now have exceeded it. We're up by about 3% for Bitcoin here today too. Yeah, certainly we are seeing some optimism of creep back into the markets. Again, putting this in perspective, Bitcoin have been under a tremendous amount of pressure ever since we did get that decision from the SEC. A lot of that thought, though, some of that optimism of an approval already baked into the price. So we did see a bit of cooling, and you can see that a bit reflected in that stock chart that we have up there on the screen right now. So we are above that 41,000 level now. Question is, how much higher can we climb? Can we get back to that 46, 47, 1,000 level that we saw not too long ago? And again, because we're seeing the price of Bitcoin rise here, obviously other names like Coinbase among the big leaders in today's market action. But Oppenheimer here in this upgrade of Coinbase calling out a number of catalysts here. One, the prospect of stronger earnings and also improving fundamentals. Because of that, they're raising the price target to 160, about 40 bucks higher than where it's trading today. All right. We also, since we're on the uh, kind of payments tip, if you will, right now, or the currency watch, time for our stock to watch. Visa shares taking a hit despite calling out a resilient consumer in its first quarter results. The payment company is seeing revenue jump nearly 9% year over year. Shares, though, down 3%. For this, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Maddie Mills into the chat, summoning her from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, where she's live in living color. Hey, Maddie. Hey, Brad. So this morning, really tough for Visa, right? They're down about 2.6%. And this points to the broader earnings story that we've seen so far this year, where you can get a good headline, but it can be tough when you look under the surface. And that's exactly what happened with Visa, right? They had some beats over the past quarter here, but it's all about that forward guidance. And if you look at the volume growth that they had over the course of the quarter when it comes to their payments, you saw that it went up earlier in the quarter and then heading into the the very start of the new year, it started to dip, and they're expecting that dip to continue. Now, they're blaming it on the weather. The analysts I've talked to say they're worried that it points to a broader economic slowdown. Now, that's really interesting, given that we're not seeing that same picture from some of their competitors in the space. I think about exactly what Sazi was just saying with American Express, seeing that stock in the green so far today. All right, Maddie, thanks so much. We're going to be checking back with you once we get closer to the opening bell. Coming up, everyone, we have that aforementioned opening bell on Wall Street. We're going to break down the morning's biggest movers. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
And there's opening bell on Wall Street as we cap off what has been an exciting trading week here so for the markets, record setting week for the markets. You can see a lot, heck of a lot of cell phones down there on the floor of the exchange. And there's the confetti going at the NASDAQ again. We are still looking at maybe some pressure, uh, at least for the Dow and the S&P here at the open. A lot of that negativity may be driven by some of the misses that we got on the earnings front. Inflation coming in a bit better than expected. We got team coverage for you here at the opening bell. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills on the floor of the Stock Exchange and Jared Blickery standing by at the Interactive. Madison, let me start with you in terms of what you're hearing from traders on the floor. When I walked into the NYSE this morning, my first question was, is today going to be driven by earnings or by the macroeconomic data? And the answer I got was one word, Intel. Intel sinking this morning off of their earnings report. That is what's driving some of the flatness that we're seeing this morning, even after we got a good headline from PCE, lower than it had been since pre-pandemic. Now, when you look under the hood of the PCE, of course, there's some mixed data, consumer spending going up. What does that mean for the Fed? But in terms of the market action, we're seeing still looking for the major Major indices to digest this mixed picture and that's why we're seeing relatively flat movement but I'm interested also in what we're seeing in the Russell still the only major index in the green today uh, they've been up over the past day nearing nine per point uh, nine percent on the past 24 hours in terms of their market movement and it it leads to this broader question of where we're going to start to see that rotation, given what we're seeing in terms of the performance of some of those big tech names, right? Obviously, next week, we're going to get a better picture when it comes to Magnificent Seven, but Tesla having a bad week this week, and then that news from Intel, will that be enough to break the historic record-breaking gains that we've seen in the S&P 500 over the past five days? Could today change that picture as we kind of strive and try Try to grind out a 12th week of gains in the past 13 across all of these major indices. Now, I do want to go back to that PCE print from today because I thought it was really interesting, particularly when you pair it with some of the uh, credit card companies reporting today, that we continue to see this bifurcation. We see that the higher earning spenders are able to keep up with the inflation picture, the lower spending ones having a little bit more trouble. Hopefully, we'll get more clarity on that when we head into Fed week next. Week. All right, Matty Mills teeing up the trading session for us from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks so much. Let's continue this conversation. We've got Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery. He's standing good. by at the home base here at the Interactive. Jared, what are you saying? That's right. Uh, tech taking a backseat, just as Matty was talking about. You can see it's the only sector in the red, down about seven tenths of a percent. Healthcare, which has done really well this year, up seven tenths of a percent. So the mirror of that. Also, materials, consumer discretionary, uh, utilities, staples, industrials, rounding out the top level here. I want to show you something from the October 27th lows last year, financials now in third place. That number one still tech, that's up 24 and a half. Then communication services where we have Meta, Alphabet, Netflix, and then financials. After that, we get real estate, all four of those outperforming. Also want to show you something else interesting that has happened, and that is the Russell 2000. That's number two in our indices up here behind the NASDAQ 100 is outperforming the S&P 500 from the October 27th lows. So just something to consider as we look at the early action. And let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100, where we have the mega caps not doing anything outstanding here to the upside or downside. Amazon is leading the way up 1%, NVIDIA down eight tenths of a percent. I'll just show you our chipboard right now, since those Intel earnings are weighing on the entire space. KLA down about 5% as well. Uh, Taiwan Semi though, that is up about six tenths of 1%. And gotta check on uh, other tech fields. This is disruption. Uh, so the lower quality balance sheets are doing well. Tesla not in that category, but it's up one and a half percent after that drubbing, a big drubbing it took yesterday. And here's China. Great start to the week. And let's see how they're rounding out uh, on the fifth day here. A lot of more green than red. So those stimulus measures, if they take effect, may be helping a bit. All right, Jared, thanks so much for breaking that down for us. Again, when you take a look at the broader market here, one of the big drivers this morning is Intel, with shares off just about 10% at the open. After the company issued a warning about its 2024 outlook that weaker than expected guidance weighing on shares just a bit, it's coming off of a mixed report here. And it's just one of several of the big tech reports that we got not only this week, but looking ahead to some of the big tech giants that are going to be reporting over the next trading week. So our 2024 forecast 
a bit ambitious. We want to bring in Brian Jacobson. He's Annex Wealth Management's chief economist and strategist to tell us more. It's great to have you here, Brian. So when you take into account the warning almost that we're getting here from Intel, clearly having an impact on some of its rivals this morning in early trading, what do you think that signals then for the rest of this earnings season? Yeah, it's an interesting earnings season. And if you actually look at analyst expectations coming in, it was a somewhat low bar that was set for the fourth quarter earnings. What I'm a little bit more concerned about, and we here at Annex on our investment committee are concerned about, is the full calendar year 2024 earnings picture. So this time, it's like it was a low bar to somewhat clear. Some are doing it. Some are tripping over that low bar, unfortunately, as uh, you are seeing. It's more or less what's going on with the longer term picture here for 2024. 24. If the consensus is calling for 11 to 12 percent earnings growth, that seems a little bit aggressive to us here. What are your clients asking you right now as, as they're trying to monitor some of these margins that are coming in this earnings season so far and, and trying to best position their portfolio for that longer term, for that outlook for the full year that you're trying to point the attention to? Yeah, you know, really last year, if you kind of think about the economic numbers, uh, one of the key words that was oftentimes used to describe the economy was resilience. Mm -hmm. And I think that investors right now are looking for resilient profit growth uh, for 2024 and beyond. So I think that resilience theme is really important. What we oftentimes try to do, though, is not just look at what are profits, but what's the trend for them. And for that, you look at the Magnificent Seven. I mean, a lot of these are real cash cows, right? But they could turn into a messy seven instead, as we've already seen with Tesla. And we'll have to see what happens then with Microsoft and with Apple as well. So it's gone from magnificent to kind of messy. And really where we're finding more opportunities is moving down capitalization. So instead of like the top names in tech, Think about more the second tier ones instead, where maybe the valuations are a little bit more attractive and they still do have that resilient profit profile. Right, we certainly have seen uh, the expectations for the Fed to cut rates as one of the big drivers here of the recent market gains. When it comes to that PCE print that we got out this morning, the fact that it was a little bit better than anticipated, do you think that keeps the discussion about a potential March rate cut? Is that still on the table? No, to be perfectly honest, I think that the odds of a March rate cut are effectively zero, um, mainly because if you look at the data that we've had, inflation is heading in the right direction and growth has stayed rather stubbornly high. Now, what that means is the Fed doesn't have to be in a rush to cut. So absent some sort of additional crisis or something that could emerge, you never know. I mean, that's almost kind of by definition what a crisis would be. It would be a news event, right? It would be new information. The Fed doesn't have to be in a hurry to cut. And I think a lot of people are thinking that for inflation to come lower, we're going to see more material slowing of the economy. But that doesn't really seem to be happening. And so really for us, they might taper their quantitative tightening and then take the next step, which would be a rate cut. But that might be more of a June story. Brian, thanks so much for joining us here this morning, breaking down all things that investors should keep on their radar as they're monitoring some of the machinations in the economy, as well as for their own portfolio. Brian Jacobson, NX Wealth Management Chief Economist and Strategist. Thank you. All right, well, coming up, everyone, Levi's, the latest retailer to announce layoffs as part of a restructuring plan. We'll speak to the company's CFO, Harmit Singh, next.
Ah, yes, the jeans trade. Levi Strauss saw a return to growth in the Americas in the fourth quarter, but its full year guidance came in below the street's expectations. Retailer also announced a restructuring plan that will include laying off 10 to 15 percent of its global corporate workforce. For more on the latest quarter, we're joined by Harmeet Singh, who is the Levi Strauss & Co. CFO and Chief Growth Officer alongside Yahoo Finance's Executive Editor Brian Sazi. Harmeet, always a, a pleasure to speak with you, especially to get some time off the back of earnings here. First, you know, I want to begin with what is driving the business from your perspective right now, and we'll get into some of the productivity initiative in just a moment. Good morning, Brian and Brad. Good to see you in the new year, and thanks for having me. Um, we just reported, as you know, our quarter four results and talked about uh, um, you know the 24 outlook. We exited 23 with great momentum. Our um, uh, revenues were up 2%, constant currency up 3%, largely driven by U.S. wholesale inflicting to growth in the quarter. So U.S. wholesale for Levi's was up 5%, um, and that was because we took into account all the factors under our control. We were able to fill the demand a lot better. Our pricing reductions on the six uh, fits we took are working, and uh, we introduced you know, a wonderful uh, pipeline of, of uh, products as um, we got into the holiday season. Holiday season, which for us is, because we closed in November, is a combination of November and December, what we call November, was fairly strong. Up high single, um, up low single digits, direct to consumer business up 9%, and robust gross margins. Overall, financially, we reported EPS up 30%, EBIT margins you know, were up 300 basis points at up 41%. And uh, Levi's, as a brand, ended the year at 5.4 billion, 5 .4 billion, a record, um, uh, you know, if you go back last couple of decades. And so we've, uh, we enter 24 with momentum. We've been cautious in our outlook. Uh, we have a strong pipeline of products, and I'm happy to talk about that uh, also. We also announced the Global Productivity Initiative, which I can talk about. And that's about making a pivot into a DTC first company, which is about um, developing a leaner, more agile operating structure as we become best in class omni retailers. So let me stop and pause there. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, and you can ask more questions. Har Harmeet, I. Uh... Hang with me here. It's Brian. Good, good, good to see you. I, I recently got back from a, a trip to Detroit earlier in the week, and my hotel was right next to a J.C. Penney. The parking lot was empty, and the mall itself looked like it was straight out of 1987. No, nobody was going there. Is that does that reflect some of the structural challenges that remain in the wholesale or department store channel? And that's the main reason why you're you're enacting this this restructuring plan. Yeah. So you know. Our direct-to-consumer business, uh, uh, Brian, which is about our own stores, um, last year, you know, across the system, we opened 105 stores. It's a record, um, and our and also includes our e-commerce business. Um, that business has been growing, um, you know, in at a low double-digit, uh, low uh, double-digit high single across the world. And for example, in Q4. We reported positive comps uh, both in our st uh, uh, st uh, stores and across the region. And um, DDC um, is now about 43% of the business on the way to 55. Now, you know, DDC first doesn't mean DDC only. We work very well with our wholesale customers. Um, we need them to enhance our distribution globally because our stores cannot be present everywhere. And that's why we are, you know, the uh, market leader. To a question about specific customers, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's about engaging customers. Uh, it's about engaging consumers. And as we make this pivot to a DDC first uh, uh, company, we will, you know, engage with our customers so that we can uh, work with them and, and uh, bring to the consumer, end consumer, the same level of experience. And more importantly, the, you know, assortments that we are winning on our DDC business across to wholesale. And that's where we think 
being a hybrid player over the long term is probably the best answer for us as, a, as an omnichannel retailer. I mean, let's talk about some of the trends that you're seeing here from the consumer with that 11% jump that you mentioned in your DTC business. I also saw the 50% jump that you guys are seeing in sales of denim skirts and dresses. You mentioned the product pipeline there just a moment ago. More specifically, what new products do you see driving that growth that you're forecasting here for 2024? Yeah, first, uh, you know, shout out to all our uh, product and uh, people and our merchants and Michelle uh, Gass is taking over as CEO because she's putting a lot more focus um, into product. So the things that we are excited about, uh, we are excited about um, you know expanding uh, our platform to ensure that we have products uh, as the world becomes warmer. So we have um, a performance cool that really works well in Asia. We're taking that around. Uh, the world, uh, we're introducing lighter uh, denim, uh, you know, products, uh, and that is, you know, uh, to ensure that people can wear, uh, you know, our products, uh, you know, through through the year. So that's one. The second is to your point about uh, dresses and skirts. We are underpenetrated in the market, and the idea is we, as a, a market leader. Uh, in denim needs to own denim lifestyle. And that's why the introduction of skirts, that's where the introduction of dresses, which is a uh, home run and we're just getting started. We're also um, looking at growing our non-denim business. I mean, our non-denim business is about 40% across all our brands. And we believe um, that uh, to own the share of uh, his and her closet, we need to expand that. So we're introducing something called a tech pan uh, that you can wear to the office. You can wear if you go to a hike and that will uh, be rolled out sometime in spring and then accelerate through the year. And I can go on and on and on. At the end of the day, the consumer gives us the permission to own a higher share of the closet, of his and her closet, and we produce great product. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be dressing you Shauna, are you uh, Brian, or you Brad, you know, in more of a head to toe uh, with Levi's. I mean, I'm wearing the 49ers, um, you know, trucker ja jacket. We are all uh, cheering for the 49ers um, um, on Sunday. And, uh, you know, having, having this collaboration with them, you know, extending the Levi Stadium naming rights, it's just one of the things that, uh, you know, we do as we come, continue to accelerate and build the brand. Well, you guys certainly have got a tough game ahead of you this weekend. And, I mean, just to let you know, I'm a big fan of Levi's. I've got a couple jackets. I was just told this morning that the denim skirts are back, so that might be my next purchase there. And Brad's rocking them right now. You I, got the, I got the black the jeans on, Harmony. I got the denim skirt uh, on now. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Um, and some of our uh, – oh, wonderful. See, you guys are, uh, are brand marketeers. Uh, I love it. Uh, I'm not going to ask Brian if he's wearing, you know, the Levi's uh, shoes, but I know he loves them. He's got, he's got the <laughs> socks. Well, he's wearing the skirt, so I don't know if we want to know anymore. <laughs> Army, always great to talk to you. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us here following your quarter. And, of course, our thanks to Sazi as well. We'll stick it right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We're going to be breaking down Tesla's earnings from three different perspectives. Their AI ambitions, what this tells us about future EV demand, and also after the recent sell-off in shares, whether or not it could make sense to add to your portfolio. All that for you next.
Tesla, a massive disappointment for the market this week. Shares, they got hammered after the company reported weak results and warned of notably lower volume growth. The sell-off, it comes following a lot of hype surrounding Tesla's AI ambitions. Valuing the name as a tech company and CEO Elon Musk was asked about Tesla's AI efforts on the company's earnings call this week. Here's what he had to say. Think of Dojo as a long shot. Um, it's a long shot worth taking because the payoff is potentially very high, uh, but it's not something that is uh, a high probability. We've got an expert panel here to break down Tesla's results on three fronts, AI ambitions, EV demand, and whether or not Tesla is a buy for your portfolio. We've got Greg Migliori, who is the Autoblog Editor-in-Chief, Will McDonough, Corestone Capital Chairman and CEO, and Daniel Kolar, who is the Interlink Head of Automotive and Mobile, uh, Mobility Practice. Great to have all of you here with us this morning. Greg, I, I want to begin with you. You know, we've been talking Tesla for a while now, and we're trying to wrap our heads around this narrative that Tesla is continuing to put into the market right now, but not just the market of investors, but those of potential buyers. What most notably on the demand front should everyone be remembering now that kind of sets the tone for the rest of this year? Hey, good morning, Brad. Good morning, Shauna. Tesla's in, a, I think, an interesting position right now. The EV market is likely going to rise, but perhaps not as aggressively as we had originally thought. So Tesla is still well positioned to capitalize on that. But as you can see by the earnings call, uh, they're not immune to the many challenges that automakers face, that traditional automakers face. They've seen pressure on margins. Uh, there's always going to be demand for Teslas, but in, what we're seeing now is many of their products are actually starting to get dated. They need to do refreshes. So in some ways, some of the shine has come off Tesla, perhaps from maybe two, three years ago, four years ago. They were truly a disruptor. Now I think they're very, you know, sort of a, a standard car company. We saw that in the earnings call this week. And when it comes to the stock price here, especially when you take into account the sell-off that we have seen this year, Matt Maley over at Miller Tayback pointing out that, hey, maybe Tesla is becoming a bit oversold. Will, I'm curious how you're evaluating the recent moves that we've seen in Tesla from an investment standpoint and whether or not this could be a good buying opportunity here for investors. I think it is a good buying opportunity. I think Tesla's on sale and people should be paying attention. You know, I don't think uh, Tesla plays the same game as traditional car companies and people have a hard time valuing Tesla because they don't know, should I value it as a tech company? They have AI, they have self-driving tech, they are innovating you know, their, their supply chain and their manufacturing processes. Or should I value it based on how many cars were sold last quarter? Uh, what their revenues were. You know, when I look at Tesla, they grew revenue in Q4 20% and just, and I'm sorry, they grew volume 20% and revenue only grew 1%. Well, the street might panic when they see that, but the reality of it is that's by design. They're trying to push volume into the market. They're trying to become the ubiquitous player in the EV marketplace, and they're trying to make their processes most efficient so that they can spit out chassis as fast as demand uh, as demand uh, warrants. And so all that considered, I mean, when we think about what this means for investors going forward, there is the consideration of what margins will look like as they've initiated this broader pricing strategy and, and a pricing war has essentially ensued as well here. When we think about, Will, ultimately, how that translates through to what investors should expect and the kind of appetite or propensity for investors who this week have seen shares move lower, and some of them saying for an environment where buy on the dip is once again kind of rearing its head as a theme again, is that the case for Tesla? I don't believe so. I think I, I think. Uh, people should be buying this dip. I think that people should look at owning Tesla as owning the most efficient car company of the next decade. I think there could be a world in our future where F-150 Lightnings are built with Tesla batteries or on Tesla chassis. I think there could be a future where Tesla is the mainline provider of all EV technology to many others, regardless of what the badge on the hood is. And when you look at Tesla, if you are to look at it as a multiple of revenue, if you are to judge them that way, you're not going to like what you see. But if you look at their growth, if you look at how fast they're able to make cars, and you look at uh, uh, how cheaply they're able to produce vehicles, which means they can sell them cheaper, which means they can still uh, make a profit to a larger demographic of, of our population, 
I think all of those things are good for Tesla to continue to be a cornerstone player uh, in this EV world that, that we're all leading ourselves into. Daniel, let's talk about AI because Adam Jonas over at Morgan Stanley is saying that there were no real AI rabbits pull out, pulled out of Tesla's hat here during the quarter. When you stack up what's realistic versus some of the ambitions that we've heard from Elon Musk, do you, say, do you think some of this hype is a bit overdone? I would say that. Um, so I mean, you take what you've been uh, hearing him talk about on the AI front and also the Chinese front, and I think that these go hand in hand right now. He sees the Chinese OEMs like BYD, Geely, Neo, Xpeng, they're his main rivals down the road. So these companies, they're not just gunning to be top dogs in EV, they're aiming to be native smart EV companies. So beyond batteries, they're putting a serious effort into cutting edge ADAS systems, infotainment, control systems, all of this is gonna be based upon AI. So, you know, Eon's clocked their rise in China. He knows they're eyeing Europe, maybe even the US. And so to keep up, he understands that they need to stay at the forefront of AI. And at the forefront of AI, how much spending do you think Tesla still needs to do in order to really get a, a its its hands around what AI not just could be for its business, but the resources that really need to be layered in at this juncture in order to get that kind of long-term ambition right, Dan? Well, I mean, again, he's looking at his main uh, competition down the road and they're throwing money at this, you know, hand, you know, hand over fist. So uh, he's got to keep up as much as possible. And he's not just going up against other, um, other OEMs like you would in the US or Europe, he is going after the entire industrial policy of the Chinese state. Greg, bringing back here to what this really tells us about demand for EVs, because that's also at the crux of this issue when we talk about the fact that the guidance or really lack thereof, leaving investors with a lot of question marks. Is there something going on here that might be out of Tesla's control in terms of the fact that EV demand, when you take a look at the automakers across the board, hasn't exactly lived up to those initial expectations. And then what that tells us about names like GM, Ford, Toyota, the list goes on. Yeah, I think basically we've seen the EV market chill a little bit. I think people have, you know, many of the early adopters who have wanted their EVs have been able to get them. There's a great sort of catalog of EVs out there right now from Tesla, from Volkswagen, Mercedes, General Motors, you name it. Uh, and you know, the number of nameplates I think is expected to rise perhaps around 50 or 60 this year. So the choices are going to get even better. What's I think frustrating Tesla and other automakers is, you know, the incentives that come from the government, as well as just the never ending sort of infrastructure question. Now Tesla got out ahead of the game with its supercharger network. So they're well positioned and other automakers are trying to join that as well. So that's sort of one part of the equation. Uh, but right now I think there is a bit of a reality check is you know, the general population tries to figure out, hey, I'm interested in an electric car, but maybe a plug-in electric or just a traditional hybrid actually fits my um, my lifestyle better. Greg, Will, Daniel, it's great to have all three of you here breaking down uh, what has been one of the biggest stories driving the markets here this week with Tesla's disappointing report. We appreciate you taking the time. Have a great weekend. All right, well, coming up, investors gaining more insight on the state of the consumer following American Express's latest quarterly results. We've got analyst reaction when we come back.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now here on this Friday. Stocks mixed as core PCE. Inflation cools even more than expected, boosting investor hopes for early and aggressive Fed rate cuts. Although right now you're taking a look at the Dow, the lone gainer. That's flat, just barely to the upside, while the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq are lower. All right, Brad, certainly uh, no shortage of news here this morning. So let's take a look at some of the trending tickers atopping Yahoo Finance's page right now. Look at that spirit off just about 16% sinking after JetBlue notified the airliner that their deal may be terminated. Now JetBlue saying in a regulatory filing that it is exploring its options, but the terms of that $3.8 billion deal may not be satisfied by the January 28th termination date. Now this, of course, coming just a few weeks after the carrier said that they would appeal the federal judge's decision to block the deal. And Colgate Palmolive reporting strong fourth quarter results with strong pricing, driving organic sales higher. The company is seeing year-over-year double-digit percentage growth in its Latin America division and its Africa Eurasia division shares higher by about 2%. And PayPal on the move after announcing six AI-driven product innovations that will roll out throughout this year. Now, the stock initially dropping on the news as investors had expected maybe a bit more from the payments giant. But again, you're looking at losses, at least today, of off just about seven-tenths of a percent. Well, we've got some more economic data out this morning. Pending home sales rising 8.3% in December, according to the National Association of Realtors. The Northeast saw a drop in transactions from last year where the West, South, and Midwest all recorded gains. And certainly, Brad, when you take a look at that, I I guess it's a bit of good news here for the home builders. The fact that we are seeing this level rise to the highest that we've seen in just about five months. You mentioned the regional breakdown there just a bit. Northeast is still falling, though, on a month-over-month basis of just about 3% in the month of November. We did, though, see the biggest pickup in the West, which was up just about 14% on a month-over-month basis. So again, all things said, yes, this is a bit encouraging and and maybe is a signal here that the housing market is starting to thaw just a little bit as we do see more of a movement out to the downside here overall in mortgage rates. Yeah, I'm taking a look at the annual median home price as well. It's expected Mm -hmm. to rise actually 1.4% to $395,100 in 2024 and then increase 2.6% to above $400,000 in 2025. So that some of the year over year to track up against one of the quotes here from Lawrence Yoon, the uh, National Association of Realtors chief economist, housing market off to a good start this year. Consumers benefiting from falling mortgage rates and stable home prices here. Uh, but job additions, income growth further going to help with housing affordability, but increased supply going to be essential to satisfying all potential demand here. And so that just to kind of round out what we're seeing overall with some of the home sales and the housing market right now. Yes, yeah, certainly. All right. Well, Brad, let's take a look at American Express because it's one of the top trenders here at Yahoo Finance, giving us a better idea of the state of the consumer right now. And you can see shares up just about 7%. The company reiterating its forecast, reporting a record full year 2023 earnings and revenue of more than $60 billion. Amex CEO telling Yahoo Finance that the company continues to perform well in a slower growth environment, a steady state, and a high growth rate economy. We've got analyst reaction to this earnings report. We want to bring in Moshe Orenbach. He's TD Cowan's managing director covering the specialty finance sector. Moshe, it's great to have you here. So certainly Amex climbing here the most in a year that we've seen. Profit profit forecast topping the streets. Expectations. What does this signal to you as an analyst just about some of the strength that we're seeing from the consumer at this point? Well, Shauna, thanks for having me. And I think what it what it shows is that the high end consumer is still spending well, maybe not as rapidly as, uh, you know, as a year ago, but still still at a pretty high level. And I think that's that is continuing. And so all of that considered, what what does this also give us in terms of insight about the consumer right now? Sure. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the consumer is. Uh, still spending a lot of money. I think what Amex has benefited from most is the diversification of that spend. In other words, they actually saw some slowdown in T&E spending, uh, kind of led by softness in airline spending, which you know used to be their bellwether. Now restaurants are larger, a larger category for them uh, than airlines, and you know T&E, which is a little over a quarter of all of their spend, 
you know, this, that means three quarters of it is coming from goods and services and more everyday spend. So it's definitely the consumer has shifted a little bit in terms of what they're spending, but they're still spending, uh, you know, fairly well. And that can be expected to increase in the high single digits in 2024. Moshe, when we talk about that, the fact, though, that there was a bit of an uptick here in net write-offs for Amex during the quarter, rising to just about 2%. In terms of maybe some of the slowdown or yeah. some of the weakness that we are seeing, to what degree do you see this being a challenge here for Amex over the coming quarters? So all, all lenders are seeing higher losses than they saw. What we're observing is that that is much less of an issue for those at the high end of the credit mm -hmm. spectrum. They tend those their customers tend to be more affected by unemployment, which is very low. Uh, at the lower end of the credit spectrum, the high rates of inflation that we've seen, while moderating, have still caused you know losses to be higher. So Amex has benefited from that you know healthy level of employment. Uh, and their high le high quality customer base. Uh, you note know, within your own kind of research here and, and, and analysis of the company that we still are sitting at overall delinquencies that are compared to a year ago level, uh, still slightly below some pre-pandemic levels coming into this report as well. All that yeah. considered, what is the level that you would look toward to say, okay, that's a red flag, that's a warning sign? Yeah. So, you know, it, it's it's a little tough to say, but uh, as you noted, they are still in the neighborhood of 15 percent below where they were pre-pandemic. So I don't think we're approaching that level. Um, I think, every, you know, you've got to watch every single company and every single kind of, uh, you know, progression because, uh, you know, there is, you know, you, you, you have had strong growth in the last few years. And sometimes when, you, you know, uh, higher losses do follow, that strong growth. So we're going to be watching it carefully, but we don't see any signs, uh, you know, out of the fourth quarter that would lead us uh, to be concerned into 2024. Moshe, there's been lots of talk just about some of the innovations, technology taking place from a lot of these uh, card companies, one of them being that tap and pay feature. In terms of how much easier maybe this is for consumers to do that, but whether or not that is a driver here for future spending, I'm curious how you see that trend playing out and then also taking into account some of that future technological innovation that we could see here over the coming years. Well, it's both technological innovation, but it's also, you know, habits. People get into habits of using the card for various types of, uh, of transactions, everyday spend, and that's really what it comes down to. And this has been true of all of the major networks, including American Express, have tried to get their customers to use that card and get accustomed to it. And one of the things that uh, they did mention on the earnings call is that millennials and Gen Zs are growing at 15%. Uh, whereas, you know, older consumers, uh, their spending is growing at, at in, the, in the low to mid single digits. And a big function is that the millennials and Gen Zs, as they come in and take an American Express card, they're much more accustomed to using it for everything as opposed to having certain categories that make sense to use a card for and other things that, you know, you use other products for. So I think that's been uh, they've been a beneficiary of that trend. And I think, uh, you know, one of the other things they talked about is is continuing to refresh the value propositions of their products and that, you know, can kind of continue to drive increased spending over time. Is American Express becoming a Gen Z brand, Moshe? I, I, I don't know if that's if, if we'd go that far, but it certainly <laughs> has attracted it certainly has, has attracted a younger demographic. And that's they've said, you know, depending on the products, you know, anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of their new accounts are coming there, uh, you know, from those from those demographics. And, you know, as I mentioned, the growth rates uh, of spend are, are significantly higher. Moshe Orenbach, who is the uh, analyst over at TD Cowan covering all things American Express, helping us break it down here today. Thanks so much. We appreciate Great. it. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Absolutely. Coming up, T-Mobile shares missing estimates in the fourth quarter despite its growth in mobile phone subscribers. We'll hear from the company's CEO, Mike Sievert, on the other side of the break.
Novo Nordisk is a Danish multinational company that has built itself into a force in the weight loss industry and, by some accounts, created an obesity market out of thin air. The popularity of its blockbuster obesity drug Wagovi and diabetes drug Ozempic for weight loss was so great that it has been credited with propping up the entire economy of Denmark. It is that impact and buzz that led Yahoo Finance to name Novo Nordisk its 2023 Company of the Year. Novo's gross profit in 2023 was nearly $26 billion, or almost a 27% increase year over year. And the stock is on a tear, up more than 50% in the past year. The company began double-digit profit growth in 2020. So let's look at what started Novo's boom with Beyond the Ticker, where we take a closer look at some of the company's biggest moments. Novo's origins trace back to 1923, when Nordisk Insulin Laboratorium commercialized insulin that its founder brought over from Canada. Two years later, two employees broke away to form a rival Novo Therapeutics Laboratorium. Nearly five decades later is when Nordisk first established its presence in the United States and in 1985 launched the NovoPen, the first insulin pen device. Four years later, the two competing Nordisk and Novo entities merged to become the present-day giant and the world's largest producer of insulin. The company finally shifted away from its reliance on insulin revenues in 2017, when the FDA approved Ozempic for diabetes and subsequently to treat obesity in diabetic patients in 2021. That was the same year Wagobi was approved for weight loss in obese or overweight adults without diabetes. These two products launched a new era in GLP-1s, which have been around since 2005. Since 2020, Novo has been on an acquisition spree, shelling out more than $7 billion on diabetes and obesity biotechs, fortifying its lead in the brand new obesity market. All right, T-Mobile out with its latest earnings results. Let's get right to T-Mobile CEO Mike Sievert. Mike, uh, hot off the earnings call here. Thanks for coming on Yahoo Finance. So, look, I've, uh, you know, I've been covering you guys for a while, especially your leadership. And on your earnings call, you really you start to talk about some 
price increases. That's the first time I've heard this from you and T-Mobile. I, walk us through this. Well, first off, thanks for having us. It's great to be here uh, just minutes after our conference call. Um, you know, listen, it, for us, the big strategy is one of perpetuating our brand value proposition for being the best value in the marketplace. And we have no intentions of changing that. And what customers have been doing is generally self-selecting up our rate card. They can't get enough of T-Mobile. When they buy it, they tend to buy some of our best plans and they offer the most data and the most generous usage policies for other devices, et cetera. That's wonderful because that's great for them so they can take full advantage of the most capable 5G network. But it's also great for us because it sees our average revenue per account rising. It rose 1.8% in Q4. We just put out a confident guide for about 2% for 2024. And all that's without the kind of pricing shenanigans that our competitors do. Where do you see opportunities to take price? Well, you know, it's about optimizations in how we efficiently deliver features to customers. For example, we changed how our auto pay discount works in Q4. And despite that, we had a normative sequential churn movement in Q4 to Q3. Um, right now, we've changed, taken a lead from Netflix. We've changed a little bit the Netflix offer, but also added Hulu because Netflix has changed their portfolio. And so these are things that we do that are guided by our brand value proposition to be the best value in the market, that are guided by what customers will appreciate and accept, but also guided to how we can be more efficient and effective in how we serve our customers so that we can compete. And if we grab an optimization here and there, it's for one reason, so we can compete. I just want to just clarify, and then I'll move on, Mike. A lot of real consumers, T-Mobile users, come on to Yahoo and come on to Yahoo Finance. So their bill is not going up a lot this year. No, not unless they decide to take a new plan that gives them even more, uh, like Netflix included, Hulu included. We have Apple TV Plus on some of our plans. We have incredible uh, data buckets for your other devices and other great features with our Go 5G plan portfolios, which might be better than the plans that they're on. You see a lot of that happening. You made a great point on the earnings call, uh, Mike, one that I always enjoy watching. I know you, you stream it on, on YouTube. Um, that people are holding on to their phones longer than they ever have been before. How is that changing the telecom industry? Well, for one thing, we subsidize deeply when you get a new phone. And so, you know, for us, it's not, it's not a good thing to slam a phone on you if you're not ready for it. And on the other hand, if you are ready for it, it's important we're there with a really competitive, compelling offer. When people want those new phones, they don't want any barriers. They want us to be there you know, and put it in their hands at a great deal. And that's what we do. Just what we don't do is slam it to people who don't want it, just to lock them into a three-year price plan so they can't leave. And you know, that's, that just wouldn't be who we are. So we have lower upgrade rates at T-Mobile and yet some of the most satisfied customers in the industry. And that's a win-win for both us and for our customers. I just had the opportunity, Mike, over at the World Economic Forum to talk to a lot of tech lead leaders. And of course, main topic there is AI. And I talked to Qualcomm CEO, Cristiano Amon, who is really bullish on putting AI on smartphones. Notably, I believe it was the new Samsung coming out, whatever it was. Do you think the, the shift to AI on smartphones means big business and, and big upgrades for your business later this year, or is this a 2025 thing? It's hard to tell, but you know today's smartphones are so feature rich and capable and AI algorithms after the training process is complete can be handled on them. And that's kind of what Cristiano is pointing out. Um, and new smartphones will get even more capable in that era. There's no question that we're just in an unprecedented moment in technology history. And one of the things you're going to find is that as AI takes more and more root and transforms from just text space to being audio and visual and video, you're going to see that the payloads of data that people move between their person, let's say their smartphone, and the cloud just continue to grow. And that's a real advantage for 5G, and it's a real advantage for T-Mobile's distinctive high-capacity 5G network. And so we're really pleased with the development because we think it'll just point out the advantages that we have in the market. On the cool tech front, where do things stand with your, your SpaceX relationship? Well, we just launched the very first satellites and completed the first T-Mobile T-Mobile direct to satellite test cells. And so we were able to text uh, to space and back with the first direct to cell communication of a T-Mobile phone. And that's incredible. So we're, you know, the next phase here is just lots of launches. You know, they're going to need to get lots of satellites into the air uh, and we should be able to get a beta going later this year as a result. Who are you targeting with a program like this? Anybody that wants to be connected anywhere they can see the sky. And that's so critical. You know, this country has 500,000 square miles where no 
wireless provider covers it. And it's very important for anybody, whether it's that lonely country road or whether it's being out in the wilderness or whether it's you know, being on a waterway, anywhere, where if you can see the sky, you're connected and you can get help and you can text a loved one and you can be found. And you know, that's, that's important for absolutely everybody. Uh, Mike, too, I, I wanted to get to the, uh, the Affordable Connectivity Program. That's slated to potentially end uh, in April. Right now, it's benefiting 23 million households. What's your expectation around that program? Well, I think it's a lot more important dynamic for some of the uh, broadband providers. And as it relates to mobile, I'll be very surprised if that program ends if people disconnect their mobile phones. You know, mobile's just so essential. What they may do is make sure they have the best deal from a great value brand. And that's where T-Mobile's well positioned because we have some of the best value brands out there, starting with our flagship Metro by T-Mobile brand and many others, including Assurance Wireless that's specifically targeted for people with very tight economic circumstances. And so we have some customers uh, on that as well, especially on our Assurance Wireless brand. And there's some financial risk there, fully covered in the guidance range that we outlined today. But it's also an opportunity for us. You know, we're going to be there to stand up for people if they lose those subsidies with an incredible value so that we can serve them. And T-Mobile has always known how to serve people with tighter economic circumstances. Lastly, Mike, we're asking all leaders. This, this, um, this is going to be an interesting year for a lot of big public companies, of course, going into uh, the presidential election later this year. As a leader, how are you preparing your business and then your people for what could be a really volatile back half of the year? Well, it's just in our culture, it's just about being there for each other and lifting each other up. And, you know, what we have a really distinctive culture at T-Mobile that is about loving our customers. And you can't give them the best possible customer experience unless you have a culture that's supportive and inclusive and allows us to pick each other up. The external world, not just politics, which are stressful for people, no matter which side you're on, but the whole external environment right now is stressful and difficult. And we create a culture at T-Mobile where people are able to bring their best selves to work and be in a supportive environment. And that translates into how we treat customers with the highest net promoter scores in the industry. All right, all right. well, our thanks to T-Mobile CEO, Mike Seaver, and of course, a Yahoo Finance Executive Editor, Brian Sazi as well. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance, much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
For a quick service restaurant, Chipotle is having quite a remarkable growth story. Taking a look at shares of CMG, the stock gaining more than 320% in the last five years. A new note out from City breaks down the recipe to Chipotle's earning success and what investors can expect ahead of the company's fourth quarter and full year 2023 results, set to report after the bell Tuesday, February 6th. The analyst behind that call joins us now, John Tower, City Director and Restaurant Analyst here. John, great to have you here with us. So uh, what, what is the all-important guacamole attachment rate and all of the other core metrics for Chipotle going to tell us about the strength of the consumer as well as Chipotle's positioning within the wallet or appetite? Yeah, Chipotle, thanks, Brad, for having me. Um, Chipotle's been doing quite well. Uh, the fourth quarter is likely going to end on a very strong note. Um, they, at least the high-frequency data that we can keep track of, using um, third-party data as well as Citi's uh, own internal credit card uh, data for the industry suggests that the industry was was okay, but Chipotle likely outpaced it uh, on a footfall basis into year-end. And the simple recipe here is just doing more of the same in terms of satisfying the customer with high throughput, a lot of food on the plate for a very reasonable price point, and occasionally new product news, weaving in LTOs. For example, in the fourth quarter, they had carne asada, brought that back to the menu. Last year in uh, the first quarter, late first quarter, you saw them bring in chicken El Pastor, which was, uh, according to them, their most successful limited time offer ever uh, on their menu. And I, I think we should just expect more of the same no matter the backdrop for the consumer going forward. And I think what's important here as well is, well, many others in the industry had been seeing some softness with respect to lower income consumer spending at stores. Chipotle's actually been seeing that group uh, do remarkably well uh, when visit at visitations to their locations and spending at their stores. And I think even though we might be heading into a choppier environment in 24, Chipotle is likely going to continue to see share gains at a store level basis, as well as through expanding accessibility through building more and more stores in the U.S. John, it certainly sounds like you think uh, they are really at an advantage compared to some of the rivals out there. I'm curious, though, in terms of that weakening consumer, has Chipotle started to see any sort of trends of a trade down here? And then when it comes to pricing, right, that has certainly been an issue here, or I should say really a focus of so many uh, companies over the last several quarters. Are, are you seeing or do you expect to see any sort of pushback on the recent price increases? So they have signaled that in 2024 they will be lowering or taking a lo lower level of pricing that they've seen in the past couple of years, uh, in part due to the fact that food cost inflation is coming down labor inflation, at least uh, in absolute on a, on a percentage basis, likely going to be in that mid single digit range in aggregate. But the availability of labor has improved quite a bit, particularly relative to 21 and 22. They have not really seen much by way of uh, pushback from the pricing that they've taken. I go back to the idea that you know, they do have very good value on the plate when you talk about the heft of the amount of food you can get relative to other uh, fast food or, or limited service occasions. Um, they do a, a pretty nice job of providing a lot of food for the dollars. And, you know, when you think about 2024, aggregate pricing will likely um, be influenced, obviously, by wage rate increases across the U.S., but in particular, California, where you're seeing uh, the fast food minimum wage rate moving to $20 an hour. This concept has about 14% of their store base uh, located in California. And the company has signaled the idea that they will take price to offset some of that incremental labor pressure in California. They haven't exactly articulated the magnitude yet as to what that will be, whether it's going to be margin or gross profit neutral uh, in that market. But I expect a little bit more. But, you know, to date, they've seen a nice impact of, I think, other consumers trading into their brand. I don't know if they're moving from other traditional limited service uh, players or if it's just them picking up from grocery, but they continue to resonate with high income, low income. Pricing hasn't seen much resistance. That had been a fear for some of the bears about 12, uh, 18 months ago, and that never really came to fruition. 
if anything, I expect them to continue to hit with some strong LTOs again in 2024, perhaps repeat what they did last year with respect to Chicken El Pastor. Uh, and you got to keep in mind, too, another lever that they have, um, others do have, but I, I would argue they, within Fast Casual, have one of the more robust loyalty programs. And that's another means to communicate value to the consumer. Right, the idea of getting a free side of guacamole after a certain amount of spend or do some surprise and delight along the way, that can affect the frequency and or check build for the consumer uh, when they join the programs. And I think that's a nice way that they can offset any sort of aggregate weakness in the category. John, talking about bringing value to the consumer, you also cover McDonald's and we're, we're closely tracking uh, those moves ahead of earnings results. I want to talk about the value aspect of McDonald's, because in your recent note, you pointed out the fact that Taco Bell currently focusing on a $3 price point when it comes to ramping their value. How big of a threat do you see this potentially being to McDonald's? Taco Bell specifically, uh, McDonald's has got a, a wide lead when it comes to system-wide sales in the U.S., points of access in terms of their stores. I'm not as concerned that Taco Bell will go one for one with McDonald's. Mm. I mean, perhaps on the margin here or there, but you know, similar to Chipotle, I think what McDonald's has done a phenomenal job of, particularly in the past three years, is ramping this mobile order ahead and loyalty program in the U.S. And effectively, the discounts that you can get through the mobile app are much different than what you can see in store on a regular basis. And I think that McDonald's is willing to say, trade off a deal here or there in the app for the information that they're getting for the consumer such that down the line, they can influence that behavior ahead in the future. So I, I am not all that concerned that McDonald's is gonna lose directly to a head-to-head -head competitor within the limited service space on value. I'm more concerned that on the margin for the industry, um, the price value relationship relative to the grocery channel, particularly for those that are more sensitive on their spending on a monthly or weekly basis, might end up impacting demand in the channel, right? The, the pricing that we've seen in cumulative levels across the space close to the high 20s since the, the 2019 relative to what we've seen in the grocery space I, I think that's going to be potentially a problem for the whole industry in 2024 and beyond, particularly if we see any sort of softening in the economy. And look, many of these operators have already spoken to it during the summer period, more so during the third quarter earnings call. The lower income consumer has been cutting back frequency, managing mm -hmm. their check a little bit more so than in past periods. And I don't think that changed at all there in the fourth quarter and might even be picking up here to start 2024. So, John, you don't see, you, you, I guess it's fair to say you don't see it really as eroding any of McDonald's market share then just in terms of the fact that they are such a dominant leader and they have that loyal customer base. Correct. Yeah. I, I would be surprised if McDonald's gave up share to direct competitors. John Tower, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning, City's Director and Restaurant Analyst. Thanks so much, John. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, well, coming up, we look ahead to a big week of tech earnings. We're going to hear from Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Meta, all reporting in the week ahead. Top analyst reaction, a preview of those earnings results when we come back.
More layoffs hitting the tech sector. Salesforce reportedly eliminating 700 jobs, according to the journal. Now, this coming after a wave of companies announced job cuts already this year. You see some of those logos on your screen. It includes Alphabet and Amazon. Well, investors, analyst shareholders are going to be listening closely to earnings calls next week to gain a little bit more insight on some of these recent cost-cutting moves. We'll hear from Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, and Alphabet all set to report earnings results next week. So here, for more on what we can expect, we want to bring in Brent Thill. He is Jeffrey's senior analyst. Brent, it's always great to get your insight, especially ahead of such a big week here for the tech sector. Heading in to next week, what's the top question you have for some of these tech giants? Demand environments, number one. Uh, AI hype uh, is number two. There's a huge hype cycle we're in, and can these companies deliver on, on AI? And then I think the just sustainability of demand, you've seen tech stocks go straight up. And I think everyone's concerned is, is there a little bit of a bubble in terms of uh, overall o- overall movement in some of these names? So the, can the demand uh, hang in uh, you know, on the backside of this? Uh, so I think you know, those, are, those are some big ones uh, at this point. I think that the biggest driver right now is you know, the AI uh, uh, bubble that we're in. Uh, certainly we believe in it, but as, as they say, uh, everyone may be overestimating, uh, you know, the, the near term and underestimating the long term. So, uh, I think that that's probably the biggest concern, especially for Microsoft, which has been running with all these co-pilot AI excitement, uh, uh, certainly Amazon, you know, can they catch up to Microsoft is, is another big topic in AI they've, they've dropped back. We think that they, they, they can throughout the year. And then I, I'd say. For Meta, the, the biggest um, thing we're watching is just overall advertising demand has been really coming back, right? We went from a hard landing to the economy to a, a potential softer landing. And that softer landing is good for uh, advertising. All the Meta checks have been phenomenal. And we've continued to hear great things. I, I'd say the last thing you know we're watching is really uh, these job cuts. Uh, and I think everyone in tech that we're talking to is saying that there are more cuts coming. Uh, I think many thought these cuts were done. Uh, but I do believe there's a lot of excess uh, waste still in the tech ecosystem. Uh, and you're going to see probably more more job cuts than maybe we we would expect. And that goes back to not that demand's bad, but I think that these companies realize that they can do more with less. And that's that's a good thing into restoring you know the bottom line health to technology. Brent, I want to come back to something that you just mentioned a moment ago in, in that we could see this bubble burst potentially at some point in the AI hype and then ultimately the show me story that's started to really formulate at this point. Is there one company that you believe is on watch at this point if that AI bubble does burst? Well, I I think you have to look at the companies where there's the most euphoria around AI and that's definitely Microsoft, uh, Adobe, uh, and, and there's a handful of others, you know, Salesforce is probably not as euphoric on AI, but, you know, those are the companies. And we think that, you know, Adobe and Microsoft are in phenomenal positions. The question is, you know, again, and this happened last year with Microsoft, which is, you know, they come out, they, sh- they show these demos, but then when you talk to the customers in the field, they're like, well, it's not quite as good as they, they demoed and the adoption is not quite as fast. And so, you know, look, Microsoft's been guiding to this, you know, they've said, Front half of the fiscal year, which just ended, no revenue. Back half of this fiscal year, which ends in June, coming up, uh, is when the revenue comes. So we're now expecting this revenue ramp. What kind of details are they going to give us? What kind of color? How are those deployments going to go? Right. All of this is talk. The implementation in the field of customers taking it starts to happen now. And I think this is where all the top execs that we know that have been software for two plus decades three decades, four decades in some cases, they're like, uh, everyone's becoming a little skeptical. Like, is this really gonna match the hype? And and I think in certain cases, like for Microsoft and their co-pilot for, for GitHub, which is their developer solution, right. the, the hype is deserved. But is, some, of the, some of the other areas, I'm not, I'm not convinced yet. Is, is there one particular kind of d- developer set or ecosystem that you're hearing developers be most excited about right now? Well, the developers are like, like blown away by what ha- is happening with Microsoft's GitHub Copilot. You know, we're we're hearing stories. I mean, there's there's stories. You know, there was a public story that Microsoft unveiled with the head of development at Instagram. I mean, now 
blown away was kind of the quote. Um, you know, we've talked to a lot of financial services firms. They're they're compl- everyone is blown away by the quality of this product. It's been in the market the longest. It's had time to brew. And I think this goes back to like, you don't just build these systems and then they go live and then everyone's like, you know, dancing in the street, right? This is this is hard stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm at a tech conference where a number of the top execs that I have incredible respect for right now are saying, you know, the biggest concern they have in 24 is an AI bubble is coming. And what that looks like when it hits, how it hits is unclear, but I think it's also important. We just got to keep this in check, which is um, this isn't going to be implemented overnight by every single company on the planet. It's going to be selective. They're, they're going to be phased rollouts. And there are certain areas you got to get the data prepped. You got to get it ready. Do you want all your data AI enabled or not? And the answer is definitely no. You don't want the interns coming in and querying the HR system and what every executive is making in comp. Right? <laughs> you know, there's just certain things that just, I mean, it's just certain things that just don't make sense. If only I could have done that so, back when I was an intern, Brent. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's so I think there's some good points of it, uh, of, hey, look, you want to be ahead of the cycle. We're advocating being long these stocks ahead of the cycle. Um, so the stock call is stay long, but there's going to be a little AI turbulence. It is not going to be uh, a smooth climb out, and it's not going to be equivalent across all vendors. You know, for example, Oracle selling contracts right now for AI. They don't even have a product in the market. They can't get the product. Products aren't even live, but they're selling contracts, mm-hmm. right? So what happens if that? I'm, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but what happens if that product isn't good? Mm-hmm. What are these customers going to do? They're going to rip up the contract, act, ask for refunds. I mean, you know, and again, a lot of other software companies, not even Oracle, are doing this. Yeah, certainly there there are a lot of risks, especially when you price in how much optimism there has been from investors, from shareholders over the last year. And that brings me to Meta more specifically, right? When we talk about the fact that Meta stock has had a massive climb over the last 12 months, rejoining that trillion dollar uh, club there. Brent, how much of that optimism has already been priced into Meta specifically? And when we talk about the stock, we've been talking about efficiency nonstop for the last 12 months. What do you think the theme is or is the theme going to change here for Meta in 2024? I think the theme is that everyone in tech is realizing that being leaner and meaner is better for everyone and that you get more stuff done. You know, this this concept of metabolic efficiency, it's one to, it's hard to understand, but when you get leaner and you drop the carbs, you feel you feel like crap at the beginning, right? You feel it's hard to go through these initial layoffs, but as you go through this, you improve your metabolic efficiency. And software companies are improving their metabolic efficiency. Meta is improving. And once you get on that, then you actually are faster. It's hard to believe, but you get faster and you get you get better. And I think everyone is realizing, and I think everyone inside Meta and, and, and Zuckerberg's been saying this the last few earnings calls, like we're 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 learning to do more with less. And we can we can actually achieve this. And you know, Elon Musk's kitchen sink at Twitter it, it, it's probably a, a, a great vision for this. I don't think it's gonna be as severe, but um, I think they're going to continue to stay lean. Many of the top meta uh, advertisers are saying just go global, keep going deeper. Uh, we're seeing prices drop. We're seeing ROI up on meta. Uh, we're seeing, yeah, everyone loved to see more video. Everyone would love to see um, certain enhancements in the platform. But for the most part, I don't think we're going to see, you know, the, the less they talk about the metaverse, the higher stock goes. And, and I think everyone's asking, what's the next big thing? And the next big thing may be their market's so big and, and so opportunistic, they can just keep going deeper in their existing markets and improve efficiency. If they keep doing that, right. you know, I think the stock goes higher. And obviously, they've, they haven't jacked up their CapEx goals. If they, if they stay true to their CapEx goals and don't have to spend a lot, you know, everyone's going to say the stock's going to grind higher because it trains still at a big discount right. to a lot of the internet peers. Yeah. Brent, we know you got a busy week ahead here. Thanks so much for carving out some time ahead of all of the earnings coming forth in the coverage list that you have, uh, an entire neighborhood uh, of tech giants out there. Brent, thanks so much. Thank you. Coming up, tech in the year ahead. A new report names AI in elections as the most pressing issue of 2024. We've got the details after the break.
A new Moody's report says the role of AI in presidential elections will be one of the most pressing issues of 2024, echoing sentiments that we've heard from several other think tanks. But what is new with AI for these upcoming elections? That's the big question. Help us break it down. We've got Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman to discuss more. Hey, guys. Uh, so uh, disinformation in elections is not new. We saw this most prominently in 2016. Uh, then we realized that it's a thing and we were better prepared for it in 2020. So I think what's going to be new in 2024 is just the sophistication of the bogus information now that uh, it's a lot easier to use AI to do fake videos that look like real people, fake audio recordings. Some of this kind of stuff is already happening uh, up in New Hampshire during the primary elections there leading up to them. There was a fake uh, robocall that went out to some voters. It sounded exactly like President Joe Biden and it encouraged people not to vote. Um, so uh, people need to be on the lookout for more stuff like this uh, popping up in 2024. I think the most important thing for people wondering, could this possibly be true, is if you see something that comes from a source you're not familiar with, especially on social media, uh, just assume it's probably bogus. I mean, that is probably a safe way to go here. Um, you know, if it's a video that seems uh, incredulous or somehow, be prepared for it. Uh, and I think we just need to be have in mind that we're going to be continually bombarded with stuff that seems a little too real uh, and be skeptical. All right, Rick, thanks so much for breaking that down for us, because certainly as a lot of the attention really focuses on the 2024 election and as the 2024 election ramps up, there was a robocall that sounded like President Biden and urged people not to vote in the New Hampshire primary. And that's fueling calls for regulation. Now, the source of the call remaining unknown. We want to bring in Nina Schick, author and advisor specializing in generative AI. Nina, it's great to have you here. And going off of what Rick was just saying, the threat that AI potentially poses here to the 2024 election. How big of a risk do you think this is? Put in perspective for our viewers. Yeah, great to be joining you today. I think that AI is just kind of the latest thing that poses a challenge in an increasingly corroded information ecosystem, right? Long before AI was even in the game, we saw how myths and disinformation can spread like wildfire online. And that includes, you know, not even very sophisticated content, just a crudely edited video, a video that's been slowed down, or even an authentic video that's simply been miscontextualized. But of course, what is now different from 2016 or 2020 is that the so-called capabilities of generative AI, which include the ability to use artificial intelligence, right, to generate synthetic video that can perfectly clone human biometrics has become far more accessible. So yes, you know, Joe Biden can be cloned, President Trump can be cloned. We've already been seeing a lot of these synthetic videos in the political sphere. But more than that, I think this is the core question or the core challenge. When people start to understand that anything can be synthetic, anything can be AI generated, anything can be faked, they begin to lose trust in everything. So you lose trust in the electoral process. You lose trust in the result. You become completely cynical. And I think that is one of the core challenges we're facing, not only in the internet age, but even augmented with the AI age now. And, and Nina, this year we spoke to a lot of business leaders at Davos about the future of AI. I want to play this quick clip for you. Here's what they had to say. AI can be used for all you know, it can be used for cyber attacks. It can be used to design a bioterrorism weapon. You know, whenever we have new technologies, they're used to achieve positive goals uh, and, and for some challenging things as well. We have spent a lot of time creating this computing engines that you can run AI on the devices that are battery power at the edge, phone, PC, the AI PC, and cars. If I had to predict, I would say 2024 is going to be kind of the year of the AI letdown. So in an election year, we're, we're already anticipating it's going to be extremely vitriolic, divisive. How can we ensure that, at least here in the U.S., especially when we know globally this is going to be a record election year with some of the campaigning and elections and polls that are going to be open elsewhere around the world, how can we here ensure 
that we're ahead of some of the largest risks uh, as the erosion of trust that you just mentioned is certainly on uh, on one of the kind of dockets for that largest risk too. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Huge year globally. I think it's something like 40% of the population goes to the poll, not least in the United States as well. Look, I'm not too optimistic about the short-term outlook, at least politically, not only in the United States, but in um, many other parts of the world. I think that divisiveness, the polarization is certainly going to continue to be a core feature of whoever wins the election in the United States. Nonetheless, I think that is indicative of something broader afoot. And I think that's largely to do with, again, we've seen how in this era of exponential technology, economies are changing, the balance of power is shifting. Mm -hmm. I think the United States, interestingly, has a lot of economic power and stands to really capitalize on exponential technologies, including artificial intelligence. However, am I optimistic that the political debate in the United States and other countries is going to be less divisive? No. But again, I think this is indicative of our traditional systems of government and our public institutions no longer being able to stand up to the challenges of an exponential age. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's this declining trust in the process. Nina Sheikh, author, speaker, specializing in generative AI. Nina, always a pleasure to get some of your insights here. We're going to hope for the best here on the generative AI front, at least in this election and future ones as well. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks. Time for a quick check of the markets here as we're taking a look at the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. You've got it in the lower corner of your screen. Looks like it's green across the board, so we'll leave things there. Rochelle Akufo and Akika, Akiko Fujita have you for the next hour. Bye.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance and happy Friday. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita. Here's what I'm watching. A cool down in prices, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, core personal consumption expenditures coming in below 3% for the first time in nearly three years. What the signals for the upcoming Fed meeting. And chip makers taking a hit this morning on the back of Intel's rocky results. We're going to speak with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger later this hour. Plus, the Biden administration halting approval of new licenses to export natural gas, saying a hard look needs to be taken over the environmental impact. First, though, as always, let's take a look at where markets are trading. We are 90 minutes into the trading day, and we are seeing green arrows across the board here. The Dow picking up some steam, up 141 points. The S&P 500 up 10, and the Nasdaq up 17. All three majors here on track for a winning week. Stocks getting a boost, as we said, on the back of that economic data with the Fed's preferred inflation gauge uh, coming in weaker than expected. We're going to break that down in just a bit. But let's take a look at where Treasury yields are on the back of that. We are seeing green arrows on that front as well from the shorter end to the longer end all up right now. The benchmark 10-year yield at 4.15%. We are beginning this hour, though, with the chip sell-off. Shares of Intel getting punished this morning. Take a look at where shares are trading right now after the company gave a muted outlook for sales in the current quarter. Intel down more than 10%. And the, this is all spilling over into the broader semiconductor space. You see AMD, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, all getting dragged down. This coming despite the sector seeing a bounce back year to date amid optimism around growth and artificial intelligence. Let's bring in our very own Dan Halley to break down some of these moves and the results as well. Dan, you know, you have to wonder how much of this is about investors judging Intel on where they are in the AI race. How much of this is just about broader expectations, Intel simply not meeting them, at least in that quarter? I think it's, you know, 50-50, uh, right? Uh, let's just break down the numbers real quick. Analysts were expecting uh, first quarter revenue to come in at $14.2 billion. Intel only coming in at $12.2 billion to $13.2 billion. Now, they say that there's uh, some headwinds that the first quarter will be uh, a little bit slower, uh, but then the uh, revenue will start to pick up in the uh, remainder of the year, whether that's on the, the PC group uh, or the data center AI group. Uh, so that's some good news, but analysts clearly not happy with what they're seeing from the first quarter and wondering where everything is going for Intel right now. Uh, the big things to, to talk about here uh, are that they're building out their Gaudi 3 AI accelerator. Uh, that's going to be launching this year. Uh, that is supposed to compete with uh, the top of the line uh, NVIDIA and AMD accelerators. Those are uh, basically the, the graphics processing units that people talk about uh, that are made for AI. And then, oh yeah, they just launched their core ultra line uh, of CPUs for consumers and enterprise. And so those are basically meant to kind of kick off that uh, AI PC age, which uh, we've been talking about. Uh, Microsoft's part of that, AMD, Qualcomm, uh, NVIDIA, uh, obviously a part of that as well. But we're, we're getting into this cycle where you know uh, the... PC refresh is coming from the early part of the pandemic uh, when people have gone out and purchased devices. We've been talking about this. Uh, and then we had seen that steep drop off of people no longer needing to go out and buy because they had gone and uh, purchased so many. So now we're kind of uh, back on that uptick. There's been uh, different groups saying that that's where we're going to be. And Intel obviously excited about that as well. But, uh, you know, we have to see where people purchase, whether or not they'll get those new chips or whether they'll go with uh, slightly older ones, save cash. Uh, especially in this kind of economic environment where people are, you know, maybe not necessarily ready to make a huge purchase like that. But uh, it, it is, it's its always important to point out that the data center uh, AI is where people want to see growth, but the PC group is still really where uh, the, the bulk of, the, uh, of Intel's uh, revenue comes in. Yeah, and we've heard Intel as well as many other chip makers sort of talk about the super cycle that could be coming, uh, especially in devices as a result of AI. Uh, we'll be watching that one closely. Dan Halley, as always, thanks so much. And we will be speaking to Pat Gelsinger, Intel's CEO, later in the hour. That's coming up at 11.35 a.m. Eastern, 8.35 Pacific. You certainly don't want to miss that. Well, let's do another check of Treasury yields. We are seeing yields pushing higher on the back of key inflation data. The PCE index, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, cooling off in December, falling below 3% for the first time since March 2021. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jen Schomberger. Uh, Jen, you could argue that the Fed got the inflation print they wanted. Do we have any more clarity on the path ahead for rate cuts? 
Hey, good morning, Kiko. That's right. The latest reading on the Fed's favored inflation gauge coming in weaker than expected, justifying the case for rate cuts sometime this year, but also leaving an open question as to how quickly the central bank could move to cut those rates. The so-called core personal consumption expenditures index, which excludes volatile food and energy prices, clocked in at 2.9 percent for the month of December. That that's weaker than the estimate of 3% and down from the mid fours earlier last year. More encouraging if measured on a six month basis, core PCE clocked in at 1.9% for the second month in a row. This after we now have two consecutive quarters of core PCE inflation at or below the Fed's target based on third and fourth quarter GDP reports. Now, this latest reading on inflation has Wall Street pricing in a 46 percent chance that central bankers will lower rates at the meeting in March. That's down from about 56 percent a week ago. Fed officials have predicted three rate cuts this year, but policymakers have been pushing back on market expectations for loosening as early as March, cautioning they need to see more data to be sure. And while inflation continues to fall as the Fed wants to see, hotter than expected economic growth could support an argument for the Fed holding rates at current levels past the March-May timeframe for the fear that if you have higher economic growth, you could see inflation re-accelerate. That is not seemingly the case at this juncture, but officials want to be sure that inflation is going to sustainably remain at their 2% target. Akiko? Okay, Jen Schomberger staying on top of those numbers for us. Thanks so much. Well, core PCE, that for Fed's preferred inflation gauge, as Jen said, coming in below 3% for the first time in nearly three years. This comes with the Federal Reserve's first meeting of the year coming on Wednesday of next week. Joining me now is Megan Horneman, Ferdinand's Capital Advisor's Chief Investment Officer. Uh, Megan, let me get your take on the number we got today. Does this change your outlook on the Fed's trajectory? No, um, obviously this is this is good news. Um, this is what it's actually been expected that we would continue to decelerate in inflation. We don't think it changes anything as far as our view on what the Federal Reserve can do this year. Um, our bigger concern is because economic growth has been strong in, to end last year, the consumer has been strong to end last year, and confidence consumer confidence has ticked up a bit. We are concerned about that reignite, reignition, I, I guess you could say, of inflation and what that would mean for the Fed. We we think they'll comment on that, that they're watching that closely. And we think that's going to keep the Fed on hold for at least the first half of this year. Did the data we got today point to any of those concerns you just highlighted? What specifically are you watching about a potential reacceleration in those prices? So most of this, the um, data that we've gotten, whether it's retail sales or their personal income and spending, let's remember that all of this is fourth quarter of last year. Um, we don't have a ton of information yet until, I guess you could say, next week um, of January data and what we're going to see in the first quarter of this year. So what we're worried about with inflation is that the consumer just continues to spend. They continue to spend with the anticipation that the Fed's going to come in, cut rates, and save the day. They're spending on credit cards. Um, the credit card debt is accelerating at, at a rapid pace. That's concerning for us from the economic standpoint. From the inflation standpoint, we're concerned about what what's going on in the Red Sea, what that means for shipping costs, what that can do to inflation. And if you if you look at consumer confidence, if these consumers continue to spend, you could see a lot of volatility and in inflation um, that could you could see some monthly data that comes in a bit higher. And that's going to spook the Fed. That's why I think they're just going to err on the side of caution and remain on hold for a while. Specifically on those shipping costs um, with what's <clears throat> playing out in the Red Sea, is this just about how prolonged this is, or are you already starting to see the impact that raises some concerns? Um, not yet. Um, you're not going to see it yet. I mean, there's been a lot of different people who are studying this that have have mentioned we should start to see maybe February or March higher prices. I mean, you could see an uptick in these inflation as early as the February um, data, possibly even the January data. It all depends, as you said, on how long this goes on. Um, let's remember the last time back in 2021 when we had a tanker that upended in the Suez Canal, and that did result in um, some impacts from that shipping. But that was a short period of time before they got that moving again. There are some economists that are saying that this could last you know, six months up to a year. That's problematic. And that's something that the Fed has to keep their eye on. 
Uh, the next big economic po uh, data point we're looking for uh, jobs numbers out next week, a week from now. Um, we've gotten a number of announcements just this week alone on tech layoffs and, you know, sort of trying to figure out how much of this is just about the overhiring that happened in the tech space. How much of this is a sign of things to come? How have you been looking at those headlines? Well, it, it's part of the cracks that we've been seeing emerging in the labor market, not just recently. This has been going on for s several months now. Um, we've been seeing these layoff reports, but it's not really filtering into those jobs numbers or the unemployment rate. Um, so that's something that, you know, that I think you're going to see continued layoffs, though, going into next year. I do think there was some overhiring. And I think part of the reason why the unemployment rate has remained so stubbornly low is that employers have been, I get hesitant to lay off. Off employers, employees as quickly as they probably should have with the economy slowing. And that's because it was hard to get employees in the first place during the pandemic. So they're holding on to them. Um, when it comes to the tech side, I, I definitely agree. It, there's been a lot of overhiring in that area. Megan Horneman, Verdant's Capital Advisors Chief Investment Officer. Good to talk to you on this Friday. Thanks. Coming up, Elon Musk warning of an EV slowdown in Tesla's latest earnings report. We're going to speak with the CEO of Blink Charging on what this means for the EV space. That's next. Novo Nordisk is a Danish multinational company that has built itself into a force in the weight loss industry and, by some accounts, created an obesity market out of thin air. The popularity of its blockbuster obesity drug Wagovi and diabetes drug Ozempic for weight loss was so great that it has been credited with propping up the entire economy of Denmark. It is that impact and buzz that led Yahoo Finance to name Novo Nordisk its 2023 Company of the Year. Novo's gross profit in 2023 was nearly $26 billion, or almost a 27% increase year over year. And the stock is on a tear, up more than 50% in the past year. The company began double-digit profit growth in 2020. So let's look at what started Novo's boom with Beyond the Ticker, where we take a closer look at some of the company's biggest moments. Novo's origins trace back to 1923, when Nordisk Insulin Laboratorium commercialized insulin that its founder brought over from Canada. Two years later, two employees broke away to form a rival Novo Therapeutics Laboratorium. Nearly five decades later is when Nordisk first established its presence in the United States and in 1985 launched the NovoPen, the first insulin pen device. Four years later, the two competing Nordisk and Novo entities merged to become the present-day giant and the world's largest producer of insulin. The company finally shifted away from its reliance on insulin revenues in 2017, when the FDA approved Ozempic for diabetes and subsequently to treat obesity in diabetic patients in 2021. That was the same year Wagobi was approved for weight loss in obese or overweight adults without diabetes. These two products launched a new era in GLP-1s, which have been around since 2005. Since 2020, Novo has been on an acquisition spree, shelling out more than $7 billion on diabetes and obesity biotechs, fortifying its lead in the brand new obesity market.
The Biden administration halting approvals for new LNG exports, saying they need time to better understand the long-term climate impacts of those shipments. That's raised concerns about the U.S. status as the world's largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Inez Foray to break down the details for us. Inez, this administration facing pressure from both sides, climate activists especially coming out and saying, look, you haven't done enough on climate, and you could argue the administration responding today. Yeah, that's right. And the analysts that I've spoken with say, look, this development comes during an election year. Uh, any freezing of or approval of an export license for LNG, uh, liquefied natural gas, would probably come after the elections. Uh, keep in mind that the analysts that I've spoken with say, look, near term, this isn't really going to have much of an impact uh, because of the projects that are already underway, uh, projects that are already operating or under construction won't be impacted. Calculations in the industry are that about up to four projects could be impacted. As far as prices are concerned, yeah, this is a bearish signal for prices because the U.S. last year became the top exporter of liquefied natural gas, leapfrogging Australia, leapfrogging Qatar. So in a sense, if the U.S. does not export as much uh, natural gas, then of course this would create uh, more of a supply uh, here in the U.S. Uh, but as you mentioned, Akiko, the bottom line is is that uh, environmentalists are saying, if you're going to be building these infrastructures to export more and more natural gas, then this means that you're going to be using natural gas more in the future. And what the industry has sort of positioned natural gas in a way is that, look, you are going to need more of it for this energy transition. As we go into electric vehicles, et cetera, you need more of, of this type of energy, which is seen in the industry as a little bit of a cleaner fossil fuel, if you will. But the environmentalists are saying, if you're going to use that much of it, this is going to be used for many years to come. Of course, the U.S. exports a lot to Europe and uh, has exported a lot over the past year because of the situation with Russia. So there's a lot of, at play here uh, when it comes to these export licenses and what this will mean near term and then longer term if some of them are not approved. Okay, and as for a breaking down that uh, news for us from the White House, thanks so much. Well, Tesla shares seeing a bit of a bounce back this morning after slumping following warnings of a slowdown in 2024. News about the fall in EV demand, especially with rising competition in the space, leaving some investors worried about the future of EV car makers and what might happen as the year progresses. Let's bring in Brendan Jones, Blink Charging CEO, to discuss more. Uh, Brendan, a big piece of this concern about the EV slowdown is the driver concern that the infrastructure simply isn't there. I mean, that would seem to suggest you've got a lot of demand on your end to install chargers. What does that demand picture look like for you right now? So we're coming off our best year. Uh, we can't give full numbers yet because we still have yet to report in March, uh, but the guidance we gave will be the best year in the history of the company, uh, both on the sales of L2 chargers uh, which is the dominant means of charging and on DC fast charging on our owner operated model as well. So not a good year. It's been a great year for Blink. And we see that continuing into next year. There, there's two parts going on. We have to educate the public as well as where the majority of charging takes place, which is in the home, at work, at other convenient locations. That is about 90 10 split. 10% you're, tra you're charging on the road with the DC fast chargers and the other 90% at home. And that's a key point as we move forward. We got to continue to educate. Uh, to that point, where are you, uh, you know, seeing the most demand uh, without giving away those numbers, as you point out, because you've got earnings um, coming up. Are you seeing more sort of distribution in malls? Is it in offices? I mean, what does that look like when you think about where the holes are? in the EV infrastructure right now? It's a great question. And where we see the biggest opportunities, let's speak, it, speak to it that way. Uh, the fleet space is literally on fire. And then the multifamily space, as you're seeing more municipalities structurally adjust. I'll give you Massachusetts as an example. You can't repave, relight, or create a new parking place in, in Massachusetts without 10 to 15% uh, EV chargers being installed. So those are the big demands, and that's where the majority of our focus. In-home sales, we do a lot of those as well, 
but public DC fast charging is only about 10% of our mix. So we have to remember, we have to change the paradigm. You can charge anywhere with an EV. You don't have to go to a depot. There's nothing like waking up in the morning and having a full tank of fuel. Uh, and that's part of the education we have to get out there. But the numbers for our business, they're quite impressive on that front. And it shows that, yeah, there might be a softening, but we're still going to have a major growth factor in all those areas as we move into 2024. Uh, Brendan, certainly been a lot made about the seven and a half billion dollars that was set aside in the infrastructure bill uh, in this under this administration for what the president said would be half a million chargers that would be distributed. Um, to date, the reports we've gotten is that that distribution simply hasn't happened outside of two states. To what extent is Blink able to tap into the funding that's available there? And what do you make of the slow distribution that has happened at a time where we have seen the White House say we've got to ramp up on EV adoption? So it it's on target, actually. And I think it's a matter of expectation management. It does take a long time. And remember that first uh, five billion dollars, predominantly DC fast charging. And that's the longest lead time of any station you can install. So there's a lot more states that are in the reward uh, element now where they're giving rewards out to different vendors. There's a whole bunch of states that have already have an approved plan. So it's all moving forward. But usually when you're looking at from the beginning of a grant process to the end, you're talking about 18 months to get it all going. But then once you get it going, the chargers start to flow in at a rapid pace and you start inaugurating stations left and right. Um, looking at Blink, as well as your competitors in this space, um, these shares have really just been hit hard because there are concerns about the higher costs up front, the long runway to profitability. Um, Blink's stock itself down more than 25 percent year to date. How do you communicate that to investors? I mean, you're telling me you're seeing record demand, and yet it doesn't seem like you're getting the buy in from Wall Street that that's going to lead to profitability down the line. So when we you know, we have a target and we've given guidance that we'll be able to positive by uh, December of this year. And we're sticking to that statement and all the numbers indicate we will achieve that. And also in Blink's model, where we're mostly oriented on L2, our capital needs are greatly different than a company that focuses on DC fast charging like EVgo and others. It's a relatively inexpensive endeavor to install L2s. And we do both sales and the owner operated model of chargers. So we profit from the gross mo uh, margin on selling equipment and services, as well as from selling kilowatts on a station level. So we really have a flexible model that differentiates us. And indeed, our goal as a company is to be the first publicly traded EV infrastructure company that is pro a bit of positive by the end of the year. OK, we'll have to hold you to that and have you back on the show. Brendan Jones, Blink Charging CEO. It's good to have you on today. Appreciate the time. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, Alaska and United Airlines grounding expectations this week, both warning about the financial fallout from halting all Boeing 737 MAX 9 jets. Alaska saying it will cost the carrier $150 million this year, while United forecast a first quarter loss. To tell us more about how Boeing's issues may affect airlines broadly, let's bring in Jarrett Billis, S&P Global Ratings, U.S. Airlines primary analyst. I'm good to talk to you, Jarrett. How big of a cloud is this over the industry? Is it just a short-term headwind for these airlines that are most reliant on MAX 9 jets, or are we going to start to see bigger ripple effects? Well, firstly, thanks for having me. Um, I would say it's a short-term issue at this point. Uh, clearly, it's still an evolving situation. I think the expectation is that uh, clearly it's going to have a negative effect on Q1 simply because um, Alaska and United aren't able to fly as much as they normally would have expected. Um, but I think as, as the issue resolves itself and, you know, more to come on that, uh, I think it's likely appear, at least to this point, it appears to be a short-term issue. Uh, that, that second point you made is key though, right? I mean, how long it will take to get this resolved. At what point does this become a bigger cloud for the industry beyond Alaska and United? Well, it, it, it's hard to say. Um, I think it, it sounds like they're starting to mobilize some of the fleet now. So uh, presumably that works itself out through uh, through Q1 of this year. Um, whether it has a ripple effect, a, a knock-on effect on how it affects um, the airlines going forward, we don't know. But all indications suggest that it's likely not going to be a protracted issue. But um, obviously it's an evolving situation and more to come. I, I think we'll probably get a little more insight uh, from Boeing once they report uh, next week. And, and from there, we'll, we'll probably have a better idea of, of the potential implications of, of the issues that they're facing. Uh, we have gotten a clearer picture of the outlook for the major airlines with earnings already underway here. Um, talk to me about some of the key takeaways that you have seen that leads to the outlook for 2024, travel demand, as well as, um, you know, what, what that balance sheet looks like for the airlines. Yeah, I think the indications are that we're we're heading into another solid year for the airlines, particularly the network carriers. Uh, I, I would say I was encouraged to hear that domestic demand is strong. Um, that was an area that investors, including ourselves, had you know some concerns of, of softening heading into this year, simply because the economy looks like it's not going to grow to this anywhere near the same level that it did last year. Uh, so that's certainly a positive. Um, a couple of the airlines have have highlighted the inflection in prices of late. Um, so that bodes well. So I think overall, the revenue story is certainly positive for the larger carriers. Um, but on, on the flip side, costs are also rising as well. So that's going to be something that has to be managed. Um, but I think overall, um, the expectation is that 2024 will be probably pretty similar to what we saw last year, which uh, from our perspective is is in line. Uh, m and certainly in focus uh, on the back of, well, JetBlue and Spirit, which is no longer, but also Alaska and um, Hawaiian Airlines announcing that merger. I mean, as you look at the balance sheet of these airlines, are, are we likely to see more of this because of the costs associated? I mean, how should we be looking on potential consolidation in the space right now? I think it's difficult to speculate. Um, the the difference I think the key difference between um, the Alaska M and A with with uh, Hawaii and the JetBlue Spirit deal is the view the overlapping of of routes and I think we feel that you know in the case of Alaska and Hawaii it appears that because there's not a lot of overlapping routes um, it, it's not likely to face the, the near the same level of scrutiny uh, from the the DOJ that that the uh, Spirit and JetBlue deal did obviously. Um, so going forward, I think, you know, any large M&A is probably unlikely um, based on what we're seeing. Um, you know, so I, I guess it's it's difficult to speculate, but I think um, based on the ruling that we saw from the JetBlue Spirit acquisition, obviously it's being appealed. Um, but that suggests that there's going to be um, some opposition to future deals going forward. So not necessarily M&A, uh, maybe M&A out of necessity, but those approvals not necessarily going through, which would make it even more difficult for any kind of consolidation. Um, bringing the conversation back to Boeing, Jared, uh, we did hear from United this week saying they expect further delays on the MAX 10 orders. Um, orders broadly with these airlines, what does that pipeline look like when you think about their cash positions? 
Well, I, I think it, it, it's hard to tell um, to what effect um, the issues that they're facing will affect the order pipeline. Um, we already know that there's been several delays to this point. Um, I think in the near term, it's actually, it could prove to be a net positive for cash flow simply because certain airlines may not incur the same level of spending that they had previously anticipated. And I, you know, United was airline in particular that highlighted that there's the possibility that um, they may not uh, reach their previously stated objectives for spending. Uh, and a lot of that is the result of not getting the planes that they expected. And we've seen that from several others. Um, so I think, you know, it's something that we're going to watch. Um, but I think the expectation is at least over the next few years, if in fact the, the spending isn't quite as much this year, potentially it gets pushed out to every year. So, um, you know, I think ultimately the, the, there is the desire to get the new planes. Clearly they're in high demand right now. Um, so we expect that to continue. Um, it's it's just something that could result in some uh, unevenness, I guess, and some, some near-term uh, choppiness to, to some of their spending plans. Jarrett Billis, S&P Global Ratings, U.S. Airlines primary analyst. Uh, appreciate the insight today. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks for having me. Amazon Prime and Prime Video users certainly want to listen up. You're going to have to cough up a bit more cash for the service if you don't want ads. For more on this, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Ali Canal for a breakdown. More ads with streaming, Ali. More ads with streaming, and this time it's hitting Prime Video. Like you said, Akiko, if you don't want ads, you're going to have to pay an extra three bucks to get that premium version. So if you're a Prime subscriber, you automatically get Prime Video in there and it's automatically going to default you to that ad supported version. Now that's not going to cost you any other, uh, anything else that's going to be the standard there. But again, if you want that premium, going to be three bucks more. And it's interesting to see Amazon entering the over the top ad supported space, especially if you think about the competitors out there. It's a really different strategy than what we've seen from a Netflix or a Disney which gave consumers the choice of ads or no ads. But Amazon is a much different company, especially because of that Prime membership. So analysts that I've spoken with have said most subscribers will probably stay on the ad-supported version. They're not going to pay up for that premium tier. Uh, Amazon also has a relatively lower cost to have ads on the platform for ad buyers as opposed to Netflix or Disney. And that could potentially bring down the cost of season TV ads across the board. It's also going to encourage a lot more competition. Netflix was specifically asked this on the earnings call if they're worried about Amazon entering the market. They said they're not. They said there's a lot of ad inventory to go around and it's only going to force them to make sure that their technology is at the top of its game in order to lure those ad buyers to their platform. But Amazon as a whole has a really broad reach, right? The audience is huge. They have a lot of tech behind them. They have a lot of data. And I think that's going to create just this, this interesting dynamic between all of the streaming services as ads become more and more prominent in the streaming landscape. And Akiko, I know you're not an ad-supported girly, but I pay for the ad-supported version for Netflix. I don't mind it. And I think just given the landscape, how many streamers we have on the market, that is a viable option for a lot of consumers out there. Yeah, you know, I was looking at the the bills, right? That adds up. You figure you've got how many streaming services? One of them's got to give if you want to keep it. Maybe you consider the ad supported tier. So maybe I'll I'll, I'll take a look. <laughs> Good. A few of them. A few of them. <laughs> Ali Canal staying on top of that for us. Thanks so much. Well, coming up, Intel shares just getting punished in the session today as first quarter guidance comes up comes up well short of expectations for investors. Our very own Brian Sazi is going to sit down with Pat Gelsinger, Intel CEO. That's coming up on the other side. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. Shares of Intel are under pressure after a challenging quarter and a little bit of a soft outlook. Let's get right to the man of the hour. That is Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger. Pat, always great to get some time with you uh, after earnings. So, look, I think um, I think investors are ignoring a lot of the progress you made in 2023, and that ultimately showed up in that fourth quarter and zooming in on this first quarter guidance. How concerned should they be about what you put forward for the first quarter? Well, like you said, we finished a great year, Q4 above on top and bottom line, finishing a great transformation year in 23. I do think there's a bit of an overreaction to uh, Q1, but I don't run this business on 90 days and nobody should expect us to. These are long-term investments and the transformation is well underway. You know, we gave a solid outlook for the year in terms of improving financials on top and bottom line every quarter sequentially, year on year. And we have a lot of tailwinds as we go through the year. AI PC, expanding accelerator, improving product line, and super proud of the team and the momentum that the Intel team has delivered this year. And as that continues into this uh, 24 uh, outlook and beyond, you know, this is overreaction, but one that we are confident on the transformation journey of this great iconic company. We are on track to make that happen. All right. You did mention uh, on the earnings call, Pat, that there will be improvement in the business in the second quarter compared to the first quarter and then sequentially after that. So let's go into the second quarter. What, what drives some of that sequential improvement? Yeah, obviously some of it is. We talked about these one-time effects that we uh, saw in areas like Mobileye, PSG, and those start to get better. But overall, as we uh, look to our product line, as we go through the year, normal seasonal behavior, and at the strengthening of AIPC, of the ramping of our accelerator product line, the improving position we have with our data center products, and our foundry business is gaining momentum day by day as we get more and more customers coming into that. So overall, we just see a lot of these things materialize as we go through the year. And this fundamental transformation of Intel as we have a world-class product fabulous company and a world-class fab and manufacturing company, as those effects take Take place, the financials improve with it as well. So overall, we're on track to deliver a great transformative journey for this company. I know you're very focused, Pat, on uh, just continuing to, to build out that foundry business. It is one of the key areas that you identified early on in your leadership. Now, now we had the, the team over at City on this morning saying Intel shouldn't even be in the foundry business. To analysts like that that are bearish on this potential opportunity for Intel, how much business, you know, what's the line of sight into business for, for the foundry uh, business and, then, and what's next in that area? Yeah, well, so they're wrong and this is key to the strategy that we have you know, for the company. We have to become a world-class foundry. It becomes a key and seminal piece. It not only helps our internal businesses as we get more discipline, process, cost effectiveness, but we open up to be a world-class systems foundry as well. And we saw three customers in our advanced packaging technology added to our portfolio in uh, the fourth quarter. We added another leadership 18A customer, another Intel 3 customer. And one by one, as those builds, we see this becoming a great portfolio of the business. And we announced a key partnership with UMC, uh, Taiwan Foundry a Company, that we're going to extend the life and bring more capacity to the U.S. consistent with the theme that we have of balance, resilience, supply chains for the world. So we're on track. This is uh, making great progress. And in February, uh, Sazi, we have our Foundry Day coming up where we'll talk about what's next after five nodes and four years, this incredible restorative journey that we've been on, laying out uh, key EDA and industry partnerships and an additional uh, customers participating and how they're gonna take advantage of this great technology engine that we're building. So overall, this is making great progress. To the noobs not familiar uh, with the transformation story at Intel, when, when does that foundry business, Pat, start becoming a consistent money maker for a company like yours? Yeah, you're going to see revenue start to ramp in 25 and beyond. We talked about lifetime deal value now exceeding $10 billion in this quarter. So we're trying to give some forward-looking indicators you know, to the uh, financial markets as we see that business building. And we'll be giving updates on that uh, periodically. Uh, but revenues here, you, know, you win a customer and now they have to design, they have to move, and those supply chains have to build as they introduce their products. 
So it takes a couple of years for that revenue to really start to accrete. That's why we want to give some forward indicators. But overall, this is a long-term business. And as we go through the decade, it's just going to keep accruing, accruing, and accruing. And as I said, by 2030, we're going to be the number two external foundry combined with our internal uh, product capacities that we require. We're back to being one of the largest providers of semiconductor technology at the leading edge logic in the world. And we're on track to make that happen. Uh, maybe this is just fresh in my head. I'm still trying to recover from the World Economic Forum in, in Davos, Pat. And I had a, we had a great conversation with Qualcomm CEO, Cristiano Oman. And he was talking about more AI arriving to actual like physical devices, handsets, PCs, you name it. This year, how many chips will Intel sell that will help power these devices? And, and how bullish are you about the AI, AI hardware cycle? Yeah, and the AI PC, as we've called it, is something we launched with our core ultra product line at the end of last year. And this year alone, we expect to ship 40 million AI PCs that are enhanced specifically for AI capabilities and key application areas, you know, Microsoft, Adobe, Zoom, Teams, all of those becoming AI enabled and the ability to run these language models that you've heard about natively on the client so you don't need to be tethered to the cloud, pay cloud fees for that, and control your own local uh, data. So this idea of edge and client AI is something we're powerfully driving in the industry. And this is Intel at its best, defining new categories, delivering volume solutions to the marketplace. And our roadmap for those products is already well underway. We have a 3X improvement coming uh, later this year, and we're gonna double that again next year and its AI capabilities. We're on track to drive this category definition. And we do believe AI comes everywhere. And that's the core of the Intel strategy. Will you be able to make enough chips to, to support the, the AI demand? We believe so. And uh, every day we're working that exact and we're building new factories and uh, capabilities. We just announced the new advanced packaging in New Mexico. We're well underway with our Arizona and Ohio expansions, as well as some of the international work that we're doing. You know, we're also seeing you know, a tremendous interest and support. You know, the U.S. Chips Office, as you know, we've laid out the CHIPS uh, program, you know, incredible uh, support at the state level, building the supply chains for the nation. You know, when, when I stood on stage with President Biden and announced the Silicon Heartland, I mean, just such a moving moment because the world is going more digital. Everything digital runs on semiconductors, and we want to have balanced and resilient supply chains rebuilding the manufacturing industry in the U.S., and we're the company that's leading the charge to accomplish exactly that. Pat, before I let you go, I've been getting a lot of mixed reads. You know, we're asking all leaders, first and foremost, you know, their thoughts going into the presidential election. And I get, I'm getting a lot of mixed reads from leaders. Bill Gates, uh, not to name drop, tells us that this administration has largely been friendly to, to the tech industry. You have Steve Schwartzman over at Blackstone saying it's become a tougher business environment for large companies to do business. Has this administration been friendly to Intel? Well, I think as any CEO should look at this, right? You're not looking at any one administration. You're looking at the policies that align with the right things for the nation and the right things for your business. And given that uh, we uh, accomplished what I believe is the most significant piece of industrial policy legislation since World War II under this administration and strong support, from them, hey, we believe that was a major milestone. That said, hey, there's a lot yet to be done and whoever is uh, sitting in the White House, we're gonna work with them to keep driving these industrial policies because they are so essential. Long-term research, you know, leadership talent development and the rebuilding of the manufacturing base with good tax and investment policies. Those are the right things for the nation, and we're going to keep driving those independent of who sits in the White House and who's uh, in the Senate and the House, respectively, because that's the right thing for our country, the right thing for our business, and we're going to drive to make those happen. Just hearing you talk about AI PCs, Pat, uh, really reminds to me that my computer, I think, is really outdated, uh, and I'm about due for an upgrade soon. <laughs> I absolutely believe you do, and we have a great core ultra ready for I'm you. Sure you I'm, sh I'm, uh, sure you, I'm sure you do. I'm sure. I'm sure you do. We'll take that offline. Uh, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, you're always great to get some time with you. We appreciate it. We know these are busy days. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right, coming up, we've got all your top tips for tax season. Keep it right here on Yahoo Finance.
The official tax filing season kicks off on Monday. That means most Americans, except those filing extensions or those affected by federally declared disasters, have until April 15th to file their taxes. For some key dates to know, tips and things to know for this upcoming tax season, we've got our resident accountant. Rebecca Chen. Can we call you that, Rebecca? Resident accountant for Yahoo Yes, Finance. you may. <laughs> Thank you, Akiko. So <laughs> I just kind of want to come up. Well, I just, the first thing I think that's really important to know are the dates. So two most important dates is the starting and ending of tax season. We are, the IRS will start accepting returns next Monday, which is January 29th. And this is important because the faster you file your return, the faster you will get your refunds. Um, the IRS has always said that the fastest way to do that is to file electronically and sign up for direct deposit for your refund. And that will take about two to three weeks to get your, uh, the refund that they owe to you. So a pretty fast process. Um, the next date that everybody should know is the end date, which is the deadline, or this year it falls on April 15. And this is important because not only is this the day that you should finish your return, but also this is the day if you're doing extension, you want to make sure you get that in by the date. But one thing that I do want to, you know, make sure people know about this day is that this, even though if you file an extension, you can postpone filing your return, but you still have to pay by that day if you owe the IRS any money. Otherwise, they could charge you penalties and interest. So for example, let's say you own them $200, but you want to file your return a little bit later. File an extension, pay that money on April 15, and then you can do your returns later. That's um, usually how the IRS works. Um, and the second thing that a lot of tax pros are watching for this tax season is this new Congress bill that is that has not been passed yet. It is actually working through the Congress as we're speaking, called the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act of 2024. It's a pretty long name, but essentially three are four of the major items that a lot of us are watching. The first is a expended um, child tax credit. So what this means is if you normally qualify for a uh, child tax credit, if this bill were to pass, you could get a little bit more. So you definitely want to make sure um, how this is heading. And this um, couple I other items that a lot of tax pros are watching are the business tax cuts. So there could be a 100% bonus depreciation again, and a full domestic R&D deduction, and then a more generous interest expense uh, limitation for companies and small business owners out there. So. Uh, as I just mentioned, this bill has not yet passed. It is still being negotiated in the Congress right now. So we are keeping a very close watch on it. Um, but this will impact the upcoming tax season if it were to go through. Uh, Rebecca, what are some other key tips that taxpayers should keep in mind, potentially to increase their return? <laughs> um, there, so this tax season, you know, we're coming out of the, the pandemic. Uh, so there's like a couple items that are pretty unique to the season, I think. The, one of the first thing that a lot of tax pros told me is that there is a shortage of CPA in the market right now. What that means is, uh, so we actually previously reported on this. A lot of CPAs or accountants are retiring, but there's not enough talent coming into the industry to fill that gap. Um, so a big tip is if you are looking for an accountant and haven't found one yet, try to do that as soon as possible because uh, a lot of uh, accountants are not taking new clients as, uh, and a lot of them are being very selective about who they are taking on just because there is such a shortage. Um, and if you are, yeah, yeah. And if you are already working with somebody, um, Ex experts just tell us be patient with them because this is one of the roughest season and roughest time of the year for many accountants. Mm -hmm. And I know that because I used to be one of them. It is a very tough time. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do, and if you want to do the um, taxes yourself, just make sure that you mm -hmm. check the IRS website to see if you qualify for free filing. Bottom line, start early so you're not scrambling come April. Rebecca Chen is always, thanks so much for that. That does it for me in this 11 to noon hour. We are looking at all three major indices on track for a winning week as we see them all in the green. Much more to come here on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here.